to be flexible about, right? So we're going to uh, change the program a little bit. First, we will have our panel, our distingu distinguished panel. Secondly, we will hear from our keynote speaker, Steve Miller. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the parents who are all here present to acknowledging the parents. It's your struggles that bring everybody here together. Um, I hear about them at the meetings. ISNAF really makes an effort to try to support everyone. And the experts and professionals who are here today are doing all they can to try to support us as well and our children uh, and stop the abuse. So um, this event has been sponsored by ISNAF and all of the professionals have donated their time to be here with you today and for the entire weekend to do the work that needs to get done and hopefully we will begin to stop the abuse. So without further ado, I will like to introduce uh, Chris Blanchett. He is with Stand Up For Gus and unfortunately Jason Patrick could not be here today. However, Chris will say a few words on his behalf. Good afternoon everybody. Um, as Cindy mentioned, I'm Chris Blanchard with uh, Stand Up For Gus. I'm the executive director working with Jason Patrick who founded the uh, the organization last fall out of an unfortunate, uh, as a lot of you in this room probably have experienced, um, an unfortunate undergoing and undertaking that his ex has taken his son away from him. Um, a lot of people in this room, a few familiar faces I see, uh, probably don't know my story. I happen to be an alienated child myself. Um, as, uh, as a young man, my parents divorced at 14, and uh, they didn't quite have their, their, their two cents about him. Mom took us away, told us things about dad. Years later, we went to see dad, lived with him for a bit. He started saying things about mom, and we had this incredible conflict you know, between... Parental alienation is real, is really where I'm going with this. And, and uh, what was great about what happened with my parents as we, as we grew older um, is that they learned what um, sharing really meant. And, and my parents, the first thing I would assume, like all of us in this room, our, our parents taught us to share. Right? Share your toys with your brother or your sister or your neighbor or your friend. Um, sharing was the first thing we learned as kids. And unfortunately, um, there, are too many, there are too many parents in this world that forget that. Uh, they forget about their kids. They forget about what the power uh, their words mean, really. And, and, and so here today, I'm, I'm representing Jason, as I said. I'm sorry he cannot be here. He's, uh, he's actually, unfortunately, on a, on a job in New York. He deeply regrets it. We, we're here humbly in, in support of ISNAF and really thank you for, for having us and, and showing the support. And really, again, it's all about shared parenting, right? And a line that we're going to be using a lot and hearing a lot recently is, um, if you really care, share. Share parenting. So that's the message I want to leave everybody with. Uh, I don't want to really come up here and talk about statistics. We know the numbers. Um, I want to bring Cindy back up. And again, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate your words. Next, I would like to introduce briefly Steve Miller, Dr. Steve Miller, who will be introducing your panel. And we will start with your panel, and I will do a formal introduction of Mr. Miller uh, after the break. Um, first, I'll uh, introduce Dr. Bill Burnett, who is a professor of psychiatry, uh, actually emeritus at Vanderbilt University, and probably the most prominent psychiatrist in the world in the area of parental alienation. Um, he has founded and directs the Parental Alienation Study Group, or PASG. Bill, you can tell us later how many members we're up to, but last I heard it was 100 and something, right? Yes, sir. And uh, he's also been involved at, at an international level and also at, at the level of lobbying to get uh, accurate information about alienation into the uh, DSM and some other important publications. So Dr. Burnett, thank you very much for joining us. Um, um, next, Linda Gottlieb, uh, who's a licensed marriage and family therapist and also a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, um, certainly one of the most experienced people in the world, if not the most experienced person in actually dealing at the grassroots with alienated, abused, and estranged children. Uh, Linda's from New York, Long Island, and uh, among other things, um, in a 40-something year career, spent 24 years working with the foster care services in New York and child protective services. Um, among other things, she has 
uh, seen about 3,000 children who by judicial decision were actually uh, abused and about 500 alienated children, about 2,500 parents who were found to have been abusive and had the children removed from their homes. Um, I think the single most impressive thing she'll tell you is that out of that group with 3,000 abused children, not one of them uh, rejected the abusive parent. Uh, now that might not be good scientific data, but it impresses the heck out of me. Uh, attorney Brian Ludner, who's here from Canada, Toronto, I believe. Am I right about Toronto? Good. There are about a handful of litigation experts in North America. Uh, those would be professionals who specialize, at least in, as part of what they do, in uh, advising trial lawyers how to try alienation cases. Uh, Brian actually does both. He's an active practicing attorney and a litigation expert. And I think probably it would be fair to say one of a handful, if not a pair of the most knowledgeable attorneys in the country in the area of alienation. Uh, next, one of those other handful of litigation experts, Dr. Michael Bone, who's a clinical psychologist uh, and the author of uh, numerous publications in the area of alienation and estrangement. I'm Steve Miller, as Cindy pointed out. Uh, uh, I'm a physician who specializes in clinical reasoning. Clinical reasoning, medical decision making. I'm a medical educator. I've directed several hundred courses in various medical topics. And what interested me about alienation is it's the single most counterintuitive thing I've ever seen in medicine. Uh, the second most counterintuitive thing is probably borderline personality disorder. And that might not be a coincidence since many of the alienating parents have a personality disorder. Um, I will just slip in this one line from my talk that's going to come later. When I mention this is counterintuitive, and I, I know that 95 or more percent of the audience is thinking that doesn't pertain to them. And actually, no, this actually pertains to you. Uh, whatever you think you might know about this, unless you are a genuine expert, uh, it, it's probably the opposite that's true. Um, but I, I know you have some very interesting perspectives on an international scale. I myself am dying to hear which countries have criminalized alienation. I, I, is it Brazil or Argentina? They're one of those, anyway. Uh, there are several that ha have taken much stronger measures than we have. Uh, recently, France, uh, the su Supreme Court in France, held that alienation was real and existed and so forth. So I just would ask you to say a few words about what's going on on an international level and then maybe also what, what you know about getting it into the DSM. Yeah, thanks, uh, Steve. Actually, a few years ago when I really got more enmeshed myself uh, at the term of art, I enmeshed in this topic, I, I sort of almost accidentally got involved with a group of uh, uh, mental health people and legal people from Europe. And we, we formed a little group. I, I met them. I met, I, I, I met them face to face at that time in Italy. And, and uh, it, it was a, a kind of an awakening to me that I sort of met them almost by accident at, at, at a meeting at another event I was at to learn that parental alienation almost identically is in all these different countries. I mean, it didn't really dawn on me that it was all over the world. And of course, every, every family's story is unique and is different, but the, the basic principles, the, the basic phenomenon occurs all over. So we also at that time were interested in influencing the DSM and the ICD. Uh, let me, those things, you know, the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. You know, it's the book that diagnoses are in, put out by the American Psychiatric Association. And then the other book, it's called the ICD, is the International Classification of Diseases, which is the book of diagnoses put out by the World Health Organization. So it, it was very, really what I wanted to do was make friends with all these people from Sweden and Germany and France and uh, Czechoslovakia, or it's actually called the Czech Republic. And to, to, because we wanted to influence not just the United States, DSM, but we wanted to influence the ICD. And so we, we formed this organization. There are a lot of organizations now. The one I'm involved with is called PASG, Parental Alienation Study Group. 
and we encourage people from various countries. So we now have about 170, 180 people. Most of them are mental health or legal professionals, but they're also just parents. A number of our members are just parents uh, who are interested in this topic. But my main point is that we attracted people from, um, we now have more than 30 countries involved in this organization, which has really been interesting. So Steve asked me about uh, some of the laws. It's actually uh, Brazil was the first country to pass a law maybe two years ago in which they made parental, they, they, they made causing parental alienation and illegal activity. And no other country has done that, although in Mexico, uh, not Mexico as a country, but a number of individual states in Mexico have done the same thing. Uh, when the Brazilian legislature passed the law, they actually, uh, they, they made it a, a, a criminal offense to cause parental alienation. Eventually when it got to, I think, I guess the president of Mexico, of uh, Brazil, uh, deleted the, the criminal provisions. So it's not actually a criminal offense in Brazil, but it is, I guess, what you would call a civil offense, and that the judge who's involved in custody cases can use that as a very specific reason on the basis to decide custody. So um, that's been really fun. I've, I've enjoyed uh, doing these international things. And in fact, we, we've, we've organized in such a way that we try to present uh, information about parental alienation at uh, international meetings. And so we, as a group, and I, I don't just mean my, myself personally, but I mean there would be a group of us would show up and we would present a symposium sort of like this. Uh, at meetings in Switzerland, and we, we did one in Amsterdam, and we, we recently came back from Madrid where we did one at the World Psychiatric Association. So I, I, that's, that's kind of my message, is that we're, we're not alone, that it's not just in this country, it's, it's all over, and I think we can learn from them. Also, there, people in other countries are doing some really important research that we can learn from. Let me ask Linda then next to give us a little overview, maybe expanding on what I just said about your personal experience with alienated children versus estranged children versus abused children. Well, my personal experience really is personal because I'm an alienated uh, child survivor of parental alienation. Uh, my mother and her mother um, turned me against my father and made me really hate him. Um, and I did reconnect with him when he would, when I was 18. Um, I'm curious, do we have alienated parents in the audience? Can we just see a show of hands? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to let you know that you just never know when your kid is gonna show up on your doorstep. And mm -hmm. I hear it all the time. Um, and circumstances change. I mean, you know, in my situation, the only way I could go to college was to move in with my father because he had moved back to New York. I graduated Teaneck High School and neither parent really had saved for college and uh, City College was free then. So my choice was go live with this person I made, I was taught to hate or give up a college education and so I, I chose the former. But the interesting thing was that as much as I went having that feeling of hating my father as if it were yesterday, I could not wait to escape my narcissistic mother. And I remember choosing to go in June to get away from my mother rather than in August when I could have waited to, to move in with this man I hate, supposedly hated. And that evaporated overnight. But I, so I just wanted to say, you just never know. now. In my book, I wrote about 56 children from 32 families. Uh, at the time that they were referred to me for therapy, probably more than 50 had absolutely no contact with their alienated parent. By the time uh, I had written the book, half had reconnected. And that was back in 2012. I still get calls every day. I'm still in touch with 31 of the alienated parents and I get calls all the time from the other remaining children, the, the alienated parent, 
that their kid has shown up or contacted them or whatever. So never give up hope. And that's very important to remember. Um, I guess for me, with my 24 years working in foster care with truly an abused population, um, it, you know, it struck me that when I transferred into uh, private practice and family therapy, how this other group of kids from divorced situations where they had a parent who did nothing that ro rose to the level of abuse or neglect, not even close, made very often with a primary caretaker, and many of them were mothers, so we shouldn't forget that mothers are uh, victims of alienation also. Um, it did, it, there was cognitive dissonance for me that why would this group suddenly hate a loving parent when all these 3,000 children who had a reason to hate a parent didn't. And so I wrote in my book that song is very true from South Pacific. You have to be taught, carefully taught to hate and fear. And I add especially a parent. So thanks to Steve's um, collaboration with me, um, you know, I, I began to realize how counterintuitive these situations were. Um, and that's the problem. We never seem to think of an alternative explanation. You know, if a child is expressing hatred for a parent, that parent must have done something to warrant it, right? I mean, that would, because it's so anti-instinctual to hate a parent. Well, what we don't do um, is think of other hypotheses, which is what Steve has taught me, that there's always another hypothesis, and that is there must be a brainwashing. And so um, that's, uh, you know, what we need to think about, and I think that that's something very important we really need to start making clear, how anti-instinctual it is, that it's counterintuitive to hate a parent, and my profession must start looking at the other explanation. Linda, let me draw that out a little bit more. I love when you use the phrase anti-instinctual. It sort of plays yin and yang to counterintuitive. Um, you, you've said to me before that it, it, there's almost nothing more counter-instinctual or anti-instinctual right. than that. Talk, talk a little more about that, because I think you have some very important observations. Well, you know, I, I think about it all the time, that you know, the instinct for survival and the instinct to protect one's young seem to be the only stronger instincts. I, mean, I have adults coming to me, they were the black sheep of the family, and they're the ones who are most eager to maintain a relationship with their parents. Um, so that, it, you know, it's such a powerful instinct that we really have to, uh, so I always say, that when a child ex expresses hatred and uh, repulsion of a parent, it's only an expression. It's, it's not what they really mean or feel. They're doing it to placate the alienating parent. And that's what we have to start making the case for. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced with what I see today that the instinct to love a parent is even stronger than the instinct to love your spouse. Now, I don't know if that's because marriage is so tenuous to, to begin with, but I actually, these, these adults come in and they don't care, They're, that drive to connect to their parent who, mist, you know, who made them the black sheep of the family, it's almost like they care more about that. Uh, and very often when people present for marriage counseling, I hear the comment, well, she or he, they're more connected to their nuclear family and bio parents than they are to me. That's how strong the instinct is. Mm -hmm. So we need to start evaluating that, that there has to be a very powerful brainwashing. Mm -hmm. to, oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. To overcome this expressed hatred, because it's not genuine and it's not real. And, you know, the other thing is that you know that it's true because as soon as the alienating parent gives that child permission to um, relinquish the hatred or expressed hatred, these kids flip like a light switch. I mean, just to give one example, I was actually doing a forensic evaluation to assess for parental alienation. And I'm actually more of a therapist than 
than a, a forensic evaluator. In fact, I don't accept custody evaluations because when they're two fit parents, I think it should be shared custody, and I won't take a position on that. But I will assess for parental alienation. And so I was given this uh, case, and I was down to the family interview. And the two children, they were girls, 9 and 11, they walked in with their alienating mother. The father was already there. And they go into his face, and they say, we hate you. We never want to see you again. They hadn't visited in nine months. Um, and we hate your sleazy apartment, and forget about us, you don't have children. So three quarters through the family interview, the mother looked at, at the father and said, I want to end this, let's settle it, Linda's right. So we sent these two kids to the playroom, I helped them work out the framework of a settlement to be finalized by their respective attorneys and the lawyer for the child, and the mother looked at the father and said, um, you can have weekend visits starting this weekend, are you available? He said, of course. And I looked at the mother and I said, well, you have to tell your children this. You're the one who has to tell them that that's what's happening. And we, she called the children back. So these kids, not one hour earlier, in their father's face saying, we hate you, we're never going to your sleazy apartment. The mother said, it's over, girls, we settled it. You start weekend visits this weekend. <laughs> they look, okay, mommy, <laughs> just like that. And um, so I, I, I did write about this case in my book. It was one of the more severe cases. And I did contact the father. Um, this was two years earlier, and he said his, 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 visit, his relationship with his children are exactly what he wants, that that was it, you know. Uh, he's, uh, so that's how fast it happens. So, and I have some other cases, if we get into it, uh, um, if we have time, where the alienation has resolved like that. What did those 3,000 children do with respect to uh, these parents? Well, the, the two most frequently asked questions were, when is my next visit and when can I go home? Mm -hmm. With respect yeah. to the abusive parent. With, yeah, right. And so they would, and they would align with the abusive parent. You know, um, mommy didn't break my arm, I fell off a swing. Um, daddy didn't burn my arm, I was reaching over the stove for a cookie. So, you know, we know also that this is the pattern. And you will see that in your alienation cases. They, these kids are aligning with the abusive, alienating parent. They're protective of that parent. Uh, and that's exactly isomorphic with what the foster care population did. So um, I think this is an incredible way to start presenting to judges and everybody else, you know, how come, you know, you have this group of children with no substantiated abuse and neglect expressing this hatred, don't take it seriously. The other thing is, you know, these judges, they say, well, the child is threatening suicide. How can I send that child on a visit or send that child home? Well, isn't it amazing, despite 3,000 children who were removed from their biological parents, most of whom placed with strangers, not in kinship foster homes, most placed with strangers, not one of them ever threatened or killed or, 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 or attempted suicide. I mean, it's such a spurious argument right. that if we start comparing this, the alienated group to the control group of foster children, you will see it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. And this is what we need to start presenting to the judges that you can give, this is child abuse, and just like any other form of child abuse, it's got to be removal from the alienating parent. I started to use this metaphor, which really makes the judges wake up on a few cases where actually transfer of custody to the alienated parent was the court order. I would say on the witness stand, if a parent said that their child has to cut off an arm, that's it. They can't keep both arms. They've got to cut, up, cut off an arm. We would remove those children in a nanosecond. And we wouldn't give the children back until the parent got it that, that, that this was child abuse. We wouldn't even think about it. Well, you know, in alienation, the parent is saying, you've got to cut off a parent from your life. You've got to sever a parent from your life. What's the difference? It's child abuse. And, that, and we should do that removal on the spot 
and that parent should not have contact or custody until they get that they're committing child abuse. Right. That I love that metaphor, and it does seem to resonate with judges. Well, here's the statement. The worst possible thing you can do if a child is saying, if you make me do that, I'll kill myself, or if you make me do that, I'll run away in, in a situation like this. The worst thing you can really do is to enable the child by teaching that child that the way you get what you want in life is to threaten to do something self-harming. Uh, or something aberrant. Uh, that would be more reason to remove a child from a toxic environment, uh, not less reason. Yeah. And if anyone wants to comment on that, I'll leave it to you. Also, right now, uh, from the audience, if anyone wants to comment on that, either Dr. Ray, Dr. Darnell, or anyone else, I think this would be a timely moment for that. No, I would completely agree with what you're saying, because if you give in to those threats, what you're teaching is the child has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Ironically, power are taken away from the parent. Right. And one of the things that, uh, when you're talking about power, and I think probably every parent here has felt this, the person who says no, which in this case is the child, is always the person that has the power. Mm -hmm. It's not the person who says yes. And children should never be brought up to believe that they're entitled to that kind of power. Mm -hmm. It's very, very damaging to the children okay. and to both parents. Um, I hope everyone, uh, this is being videotaped, I, I hope anyone watching this later heard that, but that was Dr. Douglas Darnell. It's pronounced Darnell, but it's spelled uh, D-A-R-N-A-L-L, -L. and I say that because you have some excellent books out, um, and uh, Divorce Casualties and uh, Beyond Divorce Casualties, and, and the Divorce Casualties is in its second edition, so uh, I think can't correct me if I'm wrong, I think 98 and 08, right? But, but they're both excellent, and so Dr. Darnell's not only agreed, but he felt the issue here was power, and you really don't want to empower the child to do dysfunctional things. When you're looking at the parent, if you can't get a child to do what you want them to do, you're not competent enough to be the custodial parent. That's the truth. You would never say to a child, will you consider stop using heroin today? So why would you possibly say, would you consider visiting your other parent? I mean, you know, there's certain things we reserve for parental authority, and they don't know what's in their own best interests, and that's the standard we go by. It's the adults and the professionals who know what's in their own best interests, and their own best interest is to have a relationship with two fit parents. West Virginia has made it a criminal offense, albeit a misdemeanor, uh, to make false allegations of abuse against another parent. Is that correct? Uh, someone also sa said yeah. California has a similar law but doesn't usually enforce it. Sorry. The prefrontal cortex in humans doesn't really mature until about the mid-20s. Um, the textbooks would say early 20s, but I've been doing an informal poll of neuroscientists. <laughs> and uh, most of us are underwhelmed by the exquisite decision-making of 20-year-olds. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so... You know, I think it probably varies from, from individual to individual, but I'm pretty darn sure it isn't operative at the age of 13. Um, Mr. Ludmer, uh, will you weigh in, please? Yes. Um, this is a fantastic discussion that I wish we had some judges in the room. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the issue from... A little louder, please. Yeah, sure. The issue from a legal perspective is not really legislative change. We already have laws on the books, criminally, family law, child protection law, that are sufficient. It's a failure of knowledge and it's a failure of will. It's a lack of understanding of child development. and. It's kind of a, a perversion of this nice sounding concept of the voice of the child. There's entire conferences on the voice of the child and the perception that children want a voice, want to be heard, want to be canvassed in terms of what's going to happen to them as the family restructures after a breakdown. <coughs> and to start with that point, we shouldn't be asking children 
choose between your parents. How much time do you want between each parent? And it's up to you. The question is harmful because it implies a marginalization or minimization of the importance of both parents in their life. What we should be asking is, what do you like to do? What are your needs? What extracurricular activities, schools, friends, social issues? So a proper family law decision is we assess the child's needs and interests, vulnerabilities and strengths, and then we assess the ability and willingness and competence of the parents to meet those needs. But we should be doing that without asking the child to choose, to weigh, to judge the child's own parents. That's wrong cognitively, but it's wrong spiritually and morally, which are some of the, some of the aspects that's missing from this whole debate. So, I'll first answer the question that some of you have touched on. Do we need legislative change to deal with PA? The answer is no. We do not need criminal laws to deal with PA. In almost anywhere in the world, you would have to prove the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a very high standard. Emotions and actions are conflicted. Nor do we want to criminalize parental conduct, even though it is criminal. Because even as the victim, you don't want to jail or threaten jail. Of the, you just want their behavior to change. So there are better remedies, more targeted remedies, such as $500 a missed visit, which I've used many, many times. It is remarkable to Linda's point, those of us who practice a lot in this area see these spontaneous recoveries. <laughs> like flicking a light switch is the expression we all use. It is amazing the insight children gain when the favored parent is subject to $500 a missed visit. Yeah, right. You get a shocking turnaround with no therapy. Right. Okay. If courts meant what they said and assess yeah. court costs and said to an alienating parent, your child or your house, right. which one? they would release and share the child. So we shouldn't criminalize it. We should be firm, harsh, even where necessary. But we already have the tools. Criminal harassment. When someone is destroying your relationship with your child and planting false allegations and trying to get you arrested, that's criminal harassment. Every jurisdiction in the world has something called criminal harassment. False allegations to get you charged or to have child protection authorities come in, public mischief under the Canadian Criminal Code. Almost every jurisdiction has something like public mischief. Obstruction of justice. You could go on and on. We already have criminal laws. We already have child protection laws. So in almost every jurisdiction, risk of emotional harm or actual emotional harm is on the list of child protection matters that the state is authorized to intervene to protect the child even if the child is perfectly happy staying where they are. We don't hesitate to remove children if there's a bruise on the body or they were left in a car. Anything physical. They're not being fed well. They can't seem to make it to school. They aren't getting their shots. But what we know is sometimes even more harmful, this deep-seated destruction of their psyche and their sense of self, the imbruing of hatred, which clearly is child psychological abuse in the DSM-5 context and fosters emotional harm in the child protection statute context. There's this hesitancy to act and it is pervasive that child protection authorities are dropping the ball by not understanding PA and by not acting on it. Now, the inside scuttlebutt is 
they know that it is abusive and harmful, but they see so much of it they don't have the resources to actually act in all these cases. Let me jump sure. in here just for a second because I think um, this is one of the most elite panels that I've ever seen or heard of in the area, not to mention people in the audience who should have been on the panel, but uh, there were just so many chairs. First of all, is there anyone here who disagrees with the assertion that parental alienation is a form of child abuse? And would everyone here agree with a little raising of hands that this is generally and universally accepted? Bill, are you having trouble with your shoulder again? No, <laughs> no I, I, I fully agree with that. The problem, though, with, with Brian, what Brian's saying is that it doesn't say those words in the, in the child protection protocols. For instance, the document put out by the uh, Department of, of Human Services of the United States every year called Child Maltreatment gives a definition of child psychological abuse, but it doesn't, you, nowhere in that document are the words parental alienation. In other words, I, so I think that maybe legislation isn't the thing, but I think we can take steps to try to get those words in those government documents so that they, so that they're, they, they need to consider PA when they're talking about okay. psychological well, abuse. Well, where they would look, where a child protection authority would look, would be to the mental health world. So if the mental health world could get its act right. together and publicize that DSM-5's category includes this. But we do have another very influential um, uh, body for them to look to, and that's the courts. There are tens of thousands of child protection cases so I'm not even touching the custody and access cases, child protection cases that say exactly this. Exactly this. You could walk in with an encyclopedia and say, here it is. It's definitive. To position a child against the other parent, to crush their critical thinking skills, to imbue hatred, to foster cognitive distortions is abusive in a child protection sense. Mm -hmm. So they just, it, it, it's almost like they should all come to this conference and learn, and in terms of the fear that they don't have the resources to step up and protect our children, all they have to do is do it five, ten times and publicize. Yeah. We will not hesitate to do so. Yeah. Then the family law bar will be telling their clients, better stop because you can't take them on. Mm -hmm. There's a website that you can find which is critical of some of the Canadian Child Protection Authorities and, and US as well called more, more Powerful Than God. Okay, they have huge budgets yeah. and, and it's very difficult to take them on. So if the family law world got the message that they will act, can act, and it is psychological abuse from the point of view of child protection authorities, that would spread like wildfire. Similarly, if the custody and access world, that body of jurisprudence, where you can find hundreds of thousands of cases that say exactly this, however they analyze it, what we're trying to do is pull those factors together and come up with a common medical, legal, jurisprudential, diagnostic protocol. But they're out there. And they use the words parental alienation. Some of the older ones go further and say parental alienation syndrome. But you can find hundreds of thousands of cases that say parental alienation, abusive, you fail the friendly parent principle, I'm reversing custody, or I'm giving you the proverbial one last chance. They're there. So it's a matter of education and will, disabusing the system of this voice of the child aspect, and coming up with standards of parental behavior. Here's another problem in our court systems right now. All the alienating parent has to do is throw enough mud at the other parent mm -hmm. to cast some doubt, to just level the playing field to get the judge to say, well, you're both at fault. Mm -hmm. right. No wonder the child's yes. conflicted. Yep. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. There's a, there's a little grain of truth there for those of you psychologists and non-psychologists who understand the concept of splitting. 
where the child retreats, it's too stressful going back and forth. They get grilled on return to the other house. You've, you've all experienced where they're with you and it's good in private and then on the drive back to the other parent's house, the game phase comes on and they're cold. They don't even say goodbye. They run from the car back and they show loyalty right away to the other parent, okay? So we know anybody on this panel and many of the people in the audience, if you phone them up and said, hi, you don't know me, give me 50 in minutes, here's my case. They would say in 50 in minutes, odds are you got yourself an alienation case. It's not that complicated. The problem is the lack of consistency and the lack of knowledge and the lack of uh, logical rigor in the judicial reasoning process that we need to solve. You guys are looking to people like us to solve for you. Because we have 100,000 cases and it hasn't solved it yet. Because no one's gonna read the 100,000 cases. You have to distill. So I'll walk in, in many a case, with my standard statement of law, which gets larger and larger to make the point that this is overwhelming. Still a lot of times it just doesn't sit because of the inherent biases we struggle with. What, here's a great example of an inherent bias in the system. We are prepared to listen and elevate the children's supposed issues to a level that goes far beyond what we would do in an intact family. So in an intact family, if a child says, I don't like mom's bedtime, dad's a more permissive parent. It's the race to the bottom of permissive parenting. I like dad better. I'm not talking to mom until she lets me stay up till 10.30 every night. And I don't have to eat with her. I don't want her at the dinner table, whatever. Nobody, even the voice of the children people, <laughs> would permit that behavior in an intact family. But in a separated family, everything's fair game. I've had children's lawyers arguing that little Johnny wants to play rep hockey and it's five times a week and it doesn't matter that his marks are terrible and he has ADD, that's what little Johnny wants and we favor Johnny's placement with dad because dad's a hockey dad. It, it, it just, there's no sense to that whatsoever. So the parent with boundaries, the parent with expectations, will often lose in these cases for the wrong reason. They're actually the better parent. But the word boundaries is the, there are no boundaries in family law. Everything's fair game. There's no rules, there's no moral limits on behavior, there's no spiritual limits on behavior. It's all about what the child wants and not what the child needs desperately. So if we were to reintroduce the concept of boundaries, to say that there's a box here that we're prepared to tolerate the child's behavior even though they're under stress and it's a separated family. Anything outside that box, we don't care. We're actually prepared to say the child is at fault. Child needs to take some blame here. And the parent permitting that behavior needs to take responsibility. What's another boundary? In an intact family, even if there's differences in parenting styles, we expect the two parents to work it out and give the child a somewhat consistent voice. But we know what happens in families. One of, you know, the child feels they can play one parent off against the other. One parent becomes the court of appeal in the, in the family. Those types of power struggles are always gonna happen, but generally they pull together. Why is it different in a separated family? So what we hear is framing, and judges get mixed up here all the time. So if I'm the favorite parent, all I have to do is frame the issue. Dad's abusive, and this and that and this, and I fully understand why the children don't want to see him, but I encourage them to go. I'm, you know, there's a court order. I always encourage them to go, but I understand why they don't. Perhaps they should go off and do some therapy. 
I've just absolved myself. I've framed this as a relational issue between dad and children. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed to fail then. Yeah. Okay? So in answer to the question about, and there's many problems with therapists that we won't get into here, but in terms of healthcare privacy, the answer is individual therapy, which every jurisdiction, I think in Ontario might even be 12, you start to get into these issues. At 16, you can't even force therapy on them to start with. The patient, and this is in, in O to the LM here, the patient is the family system, not yeah. any one individual right. member. Yeah. So the therapist is to do goal-oriented therapy where there's no privacy, it's fully open. And that one central therapist, not there's, you get recommendations sometimes for eight individual yep. therapeutic inputs, then number. you have therapist fragmentation, they work across purposes, one doesn't know that this has been revealed there and it's a lie, it's a huge problem. You need one central therapist, goal-oriented, with the family system itself is the patient, so there's no privacy. Then you give them an outside date, you solve it within six months, you, re you got milestones, we expect to see progress, hey, now it's starting to sound like a business. That's the way the business world operates. There's a responsibility, accountability, and performance. Not therapy that goes on for two years to no end, to no effect, and makes it worse. So we know what the answers are. We actually do. But there's a gap between the way the system out there operates and what the people who are working to get the answers know has to be. So, um, you got to consult the right experts. You got to somehow bring them to bear. These are difficult, expensive cases that drag on if they're not handled well. The answers are there. Do we have the will to solve it is really my message. Um, you just gave me a great segue into Dr. Bone, but I, I want to linger for just a moment. You said we know what the answers are. Um, I'm going to throw this out there and you can either salute it or shoot it. But um, we, unfortunately, I think you were referring to dedicated experts in alienation and estrangement. And by my count, there's probably no more than 20 of those in North America. Perhaps I have the number a little bit off. But if we is a very small number of actual experts, and the vast rest of the world uh, doesn't understand certain things, uh, it's hard to be successful in court. Um, what do you, I, you I, I guess that? people yeah. have to act as catalysts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to let you take that. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, let me start with just sharing an experience I'm having right now. I mean, everybody in this room, with maybe one or two exceptions, we're all members of the same tribe in the sense that we've all, everybody here has gone through an initiation to understand what parental alienation is. So as we talk, as all of us talk up here, Everyone's nodding, because you know, you've had that experience, you know it very well from your own experience. And we say things that may not be obvious to the outside world, but everybody here understands it, like it's so very obvious. The gap between what we understand in here, from the experience of it, if you all have, have experienced, and what is out there in the judicial world and in the mental health world, the vast majority of forensic psychologists don't get this. Yeah. In the United States, within the, uh, the field of forensic psychology, there is a, the pendulum is swinging away from a model that actually works. Yeah. It, it's swinging towards a pendulum that began in 2001 that says both parents are somehow responsible. That model has never been responsible for the de-alienation of one child, ever. Yeah. But yet the court favors it because it's the one that they can most easily apply. We're all nodding, because we all know, right? Everybody's doing the same thing. So the, the key is, how do we educate the, the, the judges, but also the mental health professionals who are sorely, I mean, the people that you would expect should really understand this, right? I mean, the forensic psychologists. I mean, in the work I do on a consultative basis, the vast majority of the cases I've become involved in, I'm going after, in some, ways both sense of that both temporally as well as aggressively after some botched evaluation done by some otherwise competent forensic evaluator who just got it not only a little bit wrong but 180 degrees wrong exactly. and these are the evaluators that the, the usual suspects that the judges know 
the collegial relationships between the judges, the evaluators, and the lawyers, mm -hmm. and they're all sort of the same, and clients sort of stream through, mm -hmm. but we have to be able to have some sort of resonant experience within them to understand that this is fixable, and that it's, it's the kind of thing that, uh, and I'm always looking for metaphors, like what uh, Linda talked about in terms of, and I found this to be very helpful, comparing what happens when children really are abused. I mean, really are abused. And what happens, they don't get alienated. If you ask any private practice therapist who just does a general practice, I guarantee you there'll be a certain segment within their outpatient population that they're treating probably for depression or anxiety or self-esteem issues. And those are people who had abusive childhoods themselves. And they're still dealing with that. But, and, and still the most powerful person emotionally in their life is that abusive parent if they're still living. Yep. So it's incredibly, incredibly uh, 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 powerful. And that sort of got off on a tangent a little bit. So. Anyway, the education, I think the main thing I want to stress to everybody here is we all know this. And to echo what Steve said, it's a small number of, of pr within the professional community. I can't stress that enough. But if you, if you talk to a forensic psychologist and say, listen, do uh, you know about this alienation stuff? 99 out of 100 will go, oh yeah. But in reality, maybe five will out of 100. Maybe, I'm probably being generous there. So I think it's, uh, it's we, have, we have a big job to do educationally and, and I think finding metaphors in very succinct ways to get people to understand what you all have experienced without having to experience it. Um, let me just jump in with a question for you. Um, a few minutes ago we were talking about child abuse and whether alienation is child abuse. Um, it occurred to me listening to that that I think the word child abuse has almost a negative connotation to most lawyers and most yeah. judges and they interpret that as name calling. And by the way, if you use words like borderline or narcissist, they also think that's name calling. <laughs> You know, if, 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 if I reported that someone had cancer, I don't think I would be accused of name-calling, but if it's a psychiatric disorder, it's name-calling. And I'm a doctor, I can't seem to escape that, so I'm sure you folks have had similar problems. On top of that, here's what I wanted to bring out. I, I think they don't understand that psychological and emotional abuse is at least as damaging to children as physical abuse. I have not yet met an expert in child maltreatment and uh, Dr. Amy Baker is probably going to show up in a few minutes for the tail end of this, uh, who's a, an expert in child maltreatment with about 100 peer-reviewed publications behind her. Um, they actually look at it very differently than most of the judges. They think, you know, if, if you slap the kid once or twice, they'll forget about it and the kid heals. If you're really damaging them psychologically and emotionally, those can be scars that last a lifetime. Yes, yes. It's worse, not better. And my experience with the court system is they kind of blow it right off because there was no violence or no physical exactly. abuse. So would you speak to that? Yes, I think that one of the big problems is that sort of uh, primitive understanding of what abuse is. It needs blood and bruises and visits to the emergency room and police reports, et cetera, et cetera. But if you think about it, even when children are severely physically abused and their wounds you know, the kid that's got the cigarette burns, that the drunken father burned, and all of those things. Those wounds heal, and then they go away, and there's no evidence of those things, unless it's really severe, nearly lethal kind of abuse, of course. But the, the so the, it, we don't have any trouble understanding that, but when we have just emotional, I don't mean just, I should put that in, in quotes, because really, if anything, it is more severe, I believe it is more severe, because there is no physical kind of marker that you can point to where you can say this shouldn't have happened. It, it, it confuses the whole sense of responsibility. And when people have been abused, they always feel in some way responsible. So if there's no physical mark there, it really endorses that and encourages that interpretation. So I think it's more severe, but I think few people really understand that. Yes, Dr. Burnett, you know, Professor I, I, Burnett. I'll just mention, I, I think we're making slow headway with regard to child psychological abuse. That, that book I mentioned called Child Maltreatment, which is the compendium every year of statistics of the United States, it now has that as a separate category. And so states now report statistically instances of child psychological abuse. When the DSM-5 came out, the the uh, child psychological abuse is now an official diagnosis. It's actually, those words are actually in the DSM, right along with child sexual abuse and physical abuse. Uh, 
So I, th I think that, oh, oh and then, you know, another thing, there are articles coming out. You know, now everybody's doing brain scans now right. of, of abused children, of, of, of adults who had been abused as children. And now it's not just physical abuse, but now there, there's this fellow at Harvard is doing brain scans of, of ch children who had been abused psychologically, okay. which shows that, yes, they have damaged brains also, just like physically abused children. So I think, I, I don't want you to be too pessimistic about this concept. I think we're actually making progress. Yeah, I think I probably get a little overboard about this sometimes, but <laughs> I get frustrated, but I, you're absolutely right. Michael, I, I, I want, I'm going to have a couple of questions more for you, but sure. while Dr. Burnett still um, has his thoughts in the air, um, let's talk about brain re rewiring. You're, you're a physician and a psychiatrist. I, I think that we know a lot more about neuroscience than we did a few years ago. There's an axiom now, neurons that fire together, wire together, which is very counterintuitive. Uh, if a child experiences certain types of behaviors, they have physical changes in the brain. And what prompts me to bring that out is that uh, Dr. Burnett was just talking about brain imaging studies, and we have functional studies now, such as uh, PET scans and functional MRI, not just anatomical structural studies. So I think among the things that the attorneys and the judicial practitioners don't, don't really understand well enough, and I'm going to ask you to please speak a little bit to that, is that if you let the child suffer this abuse, you're physically changing their brain. Emotional and psychological abuse actually is physical abuse at the worst possible level because it's actually changing brain neurons and brain wiring. So could you talk a little bit about that? Well, Steve is right. If, if you wanted to make an investment about 10 years ago, you should have invested in neuroimaging, uh, brain imaging, because it, it's, a, it's a, probably the most popular aspect of psychi psychiatric research. And people just, I mean, there's thousands of, of centers now. And Vanderbilt, where I am, we, we have the biggest size magnet, in other words, to do fMRIs, you have to have this huge magnet. And I will tell you that Vanderbilt has the largest size possible that, that, that's sold. So we're very proud of our, I think it's called a T7 or something like that magnet. But my point is that there's a lot of interest in this. And, and it does show that uh, child abuse changes the structure of the child's brain and that that carries forward through his adolescence and into adulthood, at least to some extent, and that these changes uh, can be brought about either by physical abuse or, or by general trauma, really bad things happening to the child, especially situations that he can't escape from, you know, like the kind of things that cause PTSD, and also uh, psychological abuse. So in that sense, uh, psychological factors cause physical structural changes in, your, in the brain. I think what you say is true. You know, we're at the stage of research now where there's huge interest in making observations about what changes in the brain either developmentally, you know, as people grow up or are caused by various traumas. And the whole point of it is that eventually it's hoped that, uh, that intervention or, or treatments might somehow be based on what we know about um, uh, this kind of uh, neurological changes. And I don't think we're quite, well, we are there in some small ways. I mean, there are things that you can do with <coughs> to people's brains where you cure their depression or you cure their obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, but, uh, so I think we're, we're starting to see that and, and I think there'll be a whole lot more in the future. I, I think, think I think it's important to understand though that just because there's some plasticity implying that things can change from a, psychiatric or behavioral point of view doesn't mean that it's easy. And I think that since we used to think that there was no chance for any change at all, and now we've shown there's some chance for change, people are all excited. And I'm excited. But it's still an uphill battle. Um, I'll throw in a bit of trivia, and then I'm going to go right to Dr. Bone. Um, most people don't really have a good sense of how memories form and how easy it is to implant false memories in an adult, let alone a child. Uh, and Elizabeth Loftus, who I think is here in California, has done some wonderful work on that. Uh, about 20 years ago, she wrote a review article for Scientific American that's easy to find, and I think it's referenced in, in a chapter that I've written that I'll talk about later. The reference is there. Recently, 
in terms of changing these things, there's been some fascinating evidence. We know that if someone has been exposed to psychiatric or psychological trauma and is about to develop PTSD, we can reduce the, the possibility that they actually progress by giving certain drugs, for example, beta blockers. And the prototype is propranolol, which is brand name Indorol. So if someone has had a horrible experience and you give them Indorol, that's been long known many years now, probably 10 or 20 years, you can block the formation of those negative memories and reduce the uh, incidence of PS PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That did not surprise me. What surprised me is some more recent data that if the memory is already there, when you retrieve a memory and then you refile it, you restore it, restoring is very much like having the memory formed in the first place. You take it out of the fi metaphorical file, uh, file cabinet and you then restore it. And every time you restore it, it's particularly susceptible to modification. I see Professor Burnett is nodding. Yes, this is big news in, in psychiatry and neuroscience. If you then give the propranolol or another beta blocker, you, you have the patient conjure up the memory, you've blocked them, the beta blocker refers to the autonomic nervous system, and then you just tell them, okay, and now they've restored the memory, you can modify the memory by suggestion and other things, and, and the restored memory is now different than the memory was before they retrieved it and restored it, in part because of the pharmacological intervention. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of tantalizing things uh, on the horizon that's frightening to me in another sense, though, because think yeah. of the mind control potential. Um, but the brain is plastic, and I'm, I'll take other questions later, but let me go back to Dr. Bone. I, I, I know you have two hats here today. You're a psychologist and you're a litigation expert, and I'm wondering if you could talk about issues that you've had with both forensic issues as a litigation expert and then mesh that in with your background in psychology. Well, the yes, the uh, experience, the pr predominant thing that I do really is work with uh, uh, parents and attorneys and sort of in a team concept, trying to get this story told properly to the court so the judge will understand. And there's a number, the thing I'm going to address tomorrow are the what I'm calling slippage points in that uh, when we, tr we try to do that. And it's helpful to, I think, understand those. There are a number. The, s the way the system is set up, it promotes it. It's not, uh, it, there's a systematic uh, bias toward not being able to get the story told because so much of it is counterintuitive. So we have to overcome that and find ways to succinctly uh, educate the judge. But before you do that, you have to succinctly educate the lawyer. Uh, so there's a whole concentric ring of information that needs to go out to all the people uh, involved in it. I think the, the, the word that you heard a, a number of times at the beginning of this afternoon, counterintuitive, is such an important word because, man, that is really what drives this. And being able to quickly get someone to understand how upside down everything is, is the real trick. So that's, that's the, the art and the skill. A, a good litigator, I mean, Brian as I still use the, the thing he uses, but for the influence of this parent, would that child not have, see what a beautiful little succinct way to put that? And uh, there, things like that are, are, are like magic as far as getting the audience, be it the judge or whomever to understand. But it's those things, those things that quickly cross that, that cavern because the people you're talking to are not members of this tribe. They're the other tribe. They're out there going, oh, they're okay. You know, everybody, these two people just can't get along. And that's, you know, they hate each other more than they love their child. How many times have you heard that one, right? And so we have to get across that and, and sort of some of the, uh, the techniques of doing that and some of the difficulties of that is what I'm going to be addressing uh, uh, tomorrow. It's counterintuitive for attorneys as well as judges and everyone else. And so if an attorney is trying these cases, uh, often they will say things like, uh, well, we don't, we're not going to diagnose it. Judges don't like that. We're not going to mention the word alienation. Same reason. Um, we're just going to describe behavior, right. and the judge will connect the dots. What do you think about that as a trial strategy? No. <laughs> no, they will not connect the dots. It's the counterintuitive, it's like an undertow. 
It's like the, the, the tide is shifting. It's always pulling in that direction, and you have to overcome that. So to, to assume they will connect the dots, which the lawyers will tell you very often, I know not all, will assume that uh, they will connect the dots, and they really won't. You have to connect the dots and do it repeatedly and get it from several different sources repeatedly to tell the same story with different examples over and over and over again, but again, being able to show that this is not at all what it appears. I mean, I'm reminded of a... Uh, I did hypnosis training a number of years ago, and I don't remember what the context of this was, but the guy doing the training talked about being at a subway. I used to live in New York City and live in a subway, being at a subway station like Grand Central, rush hour, and you're shoulder to shoulder. I mean, you can't even do, you can't even do that, literally. And you feel somebody pushing from behind, and you, you know, it's really annoying. Finally, you turn around and look, and the guy back there is blind. Mm -hmm. You have a complete rewiring of your experience, <laughs> don't you? It's just a complete, that's what we're looking for is ways to get the, the light bulb to go on because what I've seen when the light bulb goes on in the judge's mind, you can see it immediately and they start looking like most courts, the judge is here and you've got a table over here with one litigant and a table over here and you start to see the judge look over suspiciously at the other table. You begin mm -hmm. to see they went through an affective shift within themselves and that's what we're looking for to get the light bulb to go on. But they will not connect the dots. You have to do it for them. Okay, I, th I have a couple more for you like that too. Um, I think it's important if an attorney is trying a case like this to understand what the odds of winning would be if you don't try to educate the court. So my question is, if you know, you've done many, many cases, you make a living as a litigation expert in alienation cases, uh, and by the way, Brian does, and, and I think anyone who's a clinical expert also finds themselves advising attorneys, so I'm quite certain that Ms. Gottlieb and Professor Burnett have had many a discussion with lawyers. What, so my question is, looking only at genuine cases of severe alienation, what percentage of those cases are actually getting won by the uh, alienated parent, or to put it another way, when it's actual alienation, what percent of the time does the court get it right? If it's done properly, the, the number goes up. But if it's, if it's done in a conventional way, it's a very, very low percentage. Yeah. Very, very low. I'd say 1% or 2%. Right. I mean, when we remember the, 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 the court always favors the status quo. So you have a kid who says, I want to be with this parent and not the other parent. I hate them, blah, blah, blah. And the, the person in the court that knows the least about the case, of course, is the judge. So that, that intuitively, they're immediately protective of that child and that parent. It's two against one. So, and, and with a bias to keep the status quo going because you have to have a substantial change of circumstance in order to modify a court's agreement. It's a, it's a, goes without saying that in 99 cases out of 100, the court's going to just go with the status quo or some, some version uh, thereof. Okay. I participated in drafting Canada's equal shared parenting legislation, Bill C-560. The answer, one big answer to PA is if it was a steep hill for a favored parent to try and get a court order for a disproportionate time, there'd be a lot less incentive for them to do it. Their own lawyers would be telling them once again, you can continue on this path, but you're likely to lose and pay costs to the other side. Yep. So it is once again the lack of boundaries, the we just have this vague best interests of the child standard without boundaries that begets this type of hostile litigation, hostile tactics. And so one of the answers, it's not the only answer, is legislation which would bring in a presumption, a rebuttable presumption of equal shared parenting. So for the extreme cases, dad's an investment banker and is out of town all the time on deals, Okay, mom works shifts as a nurse. That may not work, but that's fine. That's why it's a rebuttable presumption for the extremes. But the typical situation, the typical PA case, two normative parents and a bunch of issues that shouldn't lead to this behavior being elevated to the reason why the child is acting this way would decrease significantly if we had boundaries in our legislation to guide families in restructuring. Now, the whole premise of the 
private custody and access litigation systems we have today is that if the parties can't figure it out for themselves, a judge is going to do that job for them and come up with the right answer off a blank slate, no boundaries. And there's a debate in the peer review literature about whether that's even possible. To get two conflicting stories thrown at you, some brief testimony from people who've never been on the stand before, um, a particularly aggressive cross-examiner and, and the person just can't handle it, or even this, the fact that over half of family law litigants are self-represented because they can't afford counsel. How is the judge to actually get it right? So odds are they're getting it wrong more often than they're getting it right. So the whole premise of our system is wrong and it's in this environment that we add in the difficulties of a PA case. So you're 100% right at the back that if we had some structure and boundaries to assist families in restructuring after separation, there'd be a lot less need. There'd still be need, but a lot less need for this type of form. Yeah. Question for Mr. Ledbear. You mentioned um, different uh, ways to change behavior. You used an example of $500 for missed visit, Yes. Um, what other things have you used that help change behavior? Okay. A typical court order in these cases will have a non-disparagement clause. Don't say anything negative, don't allow anybody to say anything negative to the child. <coughs> it's very hard to prove that if you don't have a webcam in the other household. So the key is positive covenants. So um, as a corporate and securities lawyer, which I've, I've been for 28 years, think about a loan agreement, <coughs> there's positive covenants, you'll maintain insurance and you won't pledge your assets to anybody else. You will um, repair and maintain and keep your intellectual property positive covenants. So what we need in these cases are court orders that say you will actively promote the other parent to the child. That's easy yeah. to prove when they don't. And I'll yeah. give you a great example. Almost everybody's experience, you're in a restaurant and you're, you need a new fork or you're, you just need your water and you flag a waiter down and they say, I'm sorry, it's not my table. <laughs> now that's not a very well trained waiter, okay? But in this context, the favorite parent says, it's not my job to solve the problems at his house. That's his job. But if the favored parent got a call from the school, call from the soccer coach, call from one of the children's friend's parents that their child was rude and disrespectful and they would be mortified yeah. and they would care about those other forms. It's only at the rejected parent's house that they don't care that it's the rejected parent's problem to solve. If they had a positive duty to act like they would when the family was intact and support the, the, the child acting properly at the other house, then you'd get them, then you'd be able to prove a case. So in answer to your question, positive covenants are essential. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, well a concrete example would be if it's reported to the favored parent that the child is rude, disrespectful, and unempathetic at the other house, then the favored parent will exercise the four tenets of parenting, guidance, boundaries, incentives, and consequences at their house to procure appropriate behavior at the rejected parent's house. That's it, it's that simple. So this one is a lot easier to prove than proving a breach of a negative covenant because you'll have a dialogue, use our family wizard, emails, whatever, not texts, because they're very hard to maintain. And you just co-parent, say, look, here's what happened yesterday. You know, I tried to get them to do their homework and they talked back to me and they did this and they said, at mom's house, I don't have to do that and whatever. So I'm asking for your help, 
Could you? I'm expecting that you'll speak with them so that this doesn't happen again at my house. Yeah. And then, so if they don't, and if it happens again, there you are. So you got something concrete. Yeah. So what do you do? About? Well, the whole idea is eventually you're going to go back to court with a proper evidentiary base and to avoid the language that sometimes judges don't like to hear. You're going to go in with a series of helpful behaviors that you wish they had done and you've documented that they didn't when asked and unhelpful behaviors that in fact they're actually doing. And so you're going to say this is a very bad co-parent and it is impacting on the children's behavior, mental health, etc. And I was here three months ago and got that positive covenant. They're in contempt of that positive covenant. So you need to do something about it. And well, I'll try to address that. I'm, you know, we do have some more time left. We just don't have more time for the panel, regrettably. Not I know you have much to say, and I know you would all love to hear more from our excellent panel. How about we give them all a hand as a thank you for this great information. And without taking any more time, I would like to introduce Dr. Miller. He has his doctorate at Brown, from Brown University and residency at Harvard and Brown. He's a board certified in internal medicine and has 30 plus years on staff at Harvard Medical School. He is a writer featured speaker, lecturer, and forensic expert in meteorological issues. In addition to being an expert in alienation and estrangement, Dr. Miller is an expert on clinical re re reasoning and decision making and has directed several hundred identifying educational courses for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very much, Cindy. For anyone who might be watching this later at home, uh, we just had a 90-minute panel with several experts, and you may hear me referring to things that were said earlier, and that's what I'll be referring to, just so I don't puzzle you at home. Um, anyway, thank you very much. I'm truly honored to be here today. Um, I've said that before, and I was sort of honored, but this time I'm really, really honored to be, to be here today. I, I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to disseminate information. Also, I want to thank uh, uh, ISNAF and Cindy Hirsch and everyone else who put this together. What excites Yes, okay. Uh, um, what excites me about this is the potential to educate the public. Um, we really have an educational problem here and I think the answer is education. I think we need to be educating courts and educating attorneys and educating psychotherapists, educating various subdivisions there. I think the attorneys for minor children or AMCs they're called the attorney for the minor child in some states uh, really thinks they're there to advocate for whatever the child happens to say and if it's an alienation case that's probably the last thing you should be doing is pushing the child's agenda. So this is an opportunity to disseminate information. As Cindy mentioned, I have had a long-term special interest in clinical reasoning, clinical problem solving, and clinical decision making. Um, about 30 plus years ago, I, I founded a medical education group that's evolved a bit, but it's now the Massachusetts Medical Education Group, formerly its, its predecessor was the Boston Medical Education Group. And we've put on over 500 seminars for healthcare professionals, you know, doctors, nurses, and others. And in all of them, with rare exceptions, the theme is clinical reasoning, clinical logic, and so forth. What I find interesting about the field of alienation and estrangement is that professionals are doing things that simply violate fundamental principles of clinical reasoning, clinical problem solving, and clinical decision making. Um, I say this respectfully, but you really don't get to raise your hand and say, well, I'm an attorney, I don't think those rules pertain to me. Well, actually they do, and the same goes for the mental health professions. These are things that one, you know, one violates at one's peril. Um, it's true there's an exception to every rule, but I'm hard pressed to think of an exception to some of the things I'm going to tell you. Um, so with that said, we are a little tight for time. I have 120 slides, 
and uh, don't get worried. Uh, some of them are, you know, very quick things, but I, I don't want to have to truncate the talk. I'd like to be able to zip through it with you at rapid pace. All right. How many of you are parents? And I mean primarily here as parents. Okay. How many of you are attorneys? Okay. How many mental health professionals? How many happen to be judges? Oh my God, 75 judges. That's incredible. <laughs> Don't turn the cameras around. I know. Film crews, there are no judges here, actually. Okay. Um, so there's a nice mix. Here's what I'm going to do, but not necessarily in a tight way. I have a case history for you, and I'm going to dissect it. And actually, I realized I forgot to change the slide on that. It was uh, originally now says anatomy of a case. I was going to have it say anatomy of a disaster. Uh, we're going to talk about some basic concepts and definitions. One thing ISNAF is trying to do is uh, send out a glossary. So uh, I've distilled what I think are the good definitions, but we'll be getting some additional input. Of all the things it's important to know about alienation, the fact that this is the most counterintuitive thing you could probably imagine in mental health or any other clinical field, counterintuitive, it was a very big deal. I have a few parenting tips, they're going to flow from what, the things I'm saying, a few litigation tips, and then we'll do a few questions and answers if we have time, and we've already had that expert panel discussion. Um, I have some simple themes, if there was only one slide to show you of the day, this would be it. Uh, parental alienation is child abuse. We spoke earlier, I think that term has such an emotional impact that Many people shy away from using it, or they prefer to say, well, it's psychological and emotional abuse. My personal preference is to say it's child abuse, and then to add specifically psychological and emotional abuse, and then to add, as we discussed in the panel discussion, and by the way, I think there's virtually unanimous consensus among experts that psychological and emotional abuse is at least as damaging to children as physical abuse, unless the physical abuse is extreme. Uh, the next major theme, well, is that we're hardwired to get this wrong. And in particular, there are inborn hardwired biases that every human brain, or almost every human brain has. And that's a huge problem. Another problem is uh, one of learned pattern recognition. And when I see these cases going poorly, I usually say, well, let me look for the pattern they're using because it's probably not the pattern that they should be using. We'll talk more about that. Um, uh, PA requires highly specialized expertise. As I said earlier, uh, in my opinion, there are probably only roughly 20 people who I would consider genuine experts in North America. Uh, at least uh, six or eight of them are here today, which is kind of cool. But if you are having your case evaluated, whether you're an attorney asking someone to tell you what it's all about, or a parent, the chances of having an actual dyed-in-the-wool expert in alienation and estrangement is not very high. Um, and finally, these cases cannot be managed like a routine case. It can't be managed as a routine therapy case, a routine litigation case, a routine custody case. They are profoundly non-routine, and I'll be expanding on that too. So in simpler terms, what I'd like to do, and this is sort of the theme of any course I've ever directed, I want to give you a conceptual framework, maybe a new one, and I want to give you some conceptual tools that would enable you to actually pro solve problems, something that's genuinely useful, whether you're a professional or a parent. Let's take a quiz. Um, I want you to answer this question with your intuition. Don't be whipping out a paper and pencil. A bat and a ball costs $1.10. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? I borrowed this from uh, a Nobel Prize winning psychologist, originally published by uh, Tversky and Kahneman. Uh, Daniel Kahneman recently wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and this is in one of the early chapters. The proper answer is that the ball, uh, sorry, that, yeah, the ball costs five cents. If you relied on intuition, then you probably wanted to scream out 10 cents. This is a cognitive bias. We're not wired well to do statistics or math. And uh, I took out the slide on this, but we now think of two different systems. System one is intuition. System two is your analytical brain. And 
if you solve this problem using system one, your intuition, you're going to probably get it wrong. If you're dealing with alienated children, it's the same type of counterintuitive. Most of the professionals who go wrong in these cases do that because they're using their system one intuition. And you need to be using your system two. System two, I said, is the analytical brain. Uh, what it does is it monitors system one and does what's called a rational override. And if it fails to kick in in a complicated case and do a rational override, you're going to have some very predictable outcomes. For example, a wrong answer, as most people probably would have said if I'd taken a poll. Um, and you're also going to have overconfidence. Uh, if it feels right to you on an intuitive level, then you're likely to have great confidence in your incorrect conclusions. And that phenomenon runs rampant throughout the field of mental health in general, and, and medicine in general as well, uh, but it's a particularly big problem in the field of parental alienation. Leon Letterman, uh, I believe, is the 1988 Nobel Prize winner in physics. And he wrote, a new intuition must be cultivated. It takes graduate students two or more years to develop quantum intuition, meaning to understand quantum mechanics even at a basic level. Two or more years. Physicists, who are the prototype good scientists, Understand that intuition isn't something you're born with, or at least not good scientific intuition. You are born with it. It's just not what you need for science. And uh, I, I think there's a problem among clinicians where they think they somehow have this intuition simply because they have a degree or they've been practicing a long time. Nay, nay, I say unto thee. Um, so let's take a case apart. I'll tell you right now, this is a case that went wrong. It's really a composite of two or three of the cases I've consulted on. But if you've seen a few, you've seen them all. Uh, I should have retitled this Anatomy of a, of a Disaster, but I overlooked that little tweet. The Gray family has uh, been divorced for three years, Mr. and Mrs. Gray, and they have one child. Uh, Joan is 40. Joe is 45. Joy is 10. Notice the pleasing symmetry as I made up the names. Joy refuses to have any contact with her mother and says, quote, she's not a good mother, she's verbally abusive, she's mean and she yells at me, unquote. Stop. Have you seen a red flag yet? What's the red flag? Right. From a clinical psychologist, that's not age appropriate for a 10-year-old. From the get-go, if your pattern recognition was finely honed in this area, you would say, wait a minute. I don't know any 10-year-olds who walk around calling their parents verbally abusive. Wonder where that phrase came from. She hasn't seen her mother in a year. OK, that's not normal behavior. Normal parents would not tolerate that. When, when you put the uh, father, in this case it's the father, when you put Joe on the stand, and if you're an attorney and you're cross-examining him, you should be saying, uh, Mr. Gray, so Joy won't see her mom? That's right. Uh, she, she refuses and I can't force her. Well, let me ask you a question. What have you been doing for the last year? What do you mean? Well, were there any consequences for the child? What do you mean? You know, like you're grounded until you see mom or uh, no cell phone or no TV. You know, what kind of behavior is this? Long pause. If you're the attorney asking that question, you're going to have a good day. Uh, <laughs> especially since uh, people like Michael Bone and uh, Brian Ludmer, you know, we have 10 hours of those questions. Uh, oops, did I click ahead of myself? Yeah, okay. So Joy has not seen her mother in a year. I want to milk that a little more too. I already know that the father probably has a personality disorder. If this is for real, and if there's no allegation of abuse or neglect, a normal person just never does that to their child. You'll see how I can be so sure of that in a few minutes. But I can. I can actually math model that mathematically and show you that the probability is in the high 90s right there. And I can get most people to agree with the assumptions I'm using. They just don't want to draw that conclusion. Uh, Joe says he encourages Joy to see her mother, but, quote, Joy refuses to see her and I can't force her, unquote. Joe's filed for full legal and physical custody. There's a huge discrepancy right there as well. Um, if he really is encouraging the child to see the mom, for what reason, sir? In court, I love to say for what reason instead of why. You know, for what reason 
are you in court here if in fact you're encouraging the child to have co-parenting? That's a discrepancy. Now you know any one or two or three or four or five or six discrepancies or maybe 10 or 20, you might be able to explain away. But the typical case here, there's dozens of them. You can't explain away dozens of such discrepancies. Well, Joan decides, having done anything to warrant such extreme rejection by Joy, adding that until the divorce, she and Joy had a good relationship. Quote, we had a good relationship. We were close. It was normal. Unquote. That's a typical comment from a targeted or alienated parent. She's read about parental alienation syndrome, PAS, and believes the description fits her family, and she too has hired an attorney. Any patterns to see there? Well, I think the only pattern I'd say is it's very consistent. I, I've stopped using the term syndrome, but it is a syndrome, and I'll explain why I've stopped using it, but mainly to avoid controversy. Um, but I, I think you need to see the pattern that, that she's a, a victim here and she has no choice but to hire an attorney. One, thing that, one mistake not to make is, well, he said this and she said that. He's got an attorney, she's got an attorney. Well, who started this? You know, once one person gets an attorney, only a fool would have a, you know, have him or herself for a client. Um, okay, the attorney, helpfully and with the best of intentions, recommends reunification therapy. Joe refu refuses initially, stating that, quote, Joy won't go, unquote, but he later reports he's convinced her to give it a try. Now, that might all be true. I, I, I want to try to take some of the sarcasm out of my voice. I do know that I've rigged this case, and this is a composite of a case that we know was a very severe alienation case. But frankly, it's very, very typical as well. Uh, at this point, an expert should be saying, I, I have to maintain neutrality. Don't let my intuition kick in. I want to go by, by pattern recognition. Right now, the pattern is kind of looking like this could be an alienation case. I don't really know that yet. I have to be gathering data. But at least it's on my radar screen, and at least I've got competing hypotheses here, and I need to like gather evidence and rule one in and rule them out and all that. Uh, and they start, okay, so back to the scenario. They start weekly therapy sessions. I'd be thinking, All right, let's see how those go, or if I'm doing a retroactive review, let's see how those went, because there's a pattern here. If, in fact, this is alienation, they will almost never succeed. And if it's not alienation, they will probably make progress. That is a therapeutic trial with great predictive value. Not 100%, but it's important. So six months pass. Things have gone from bad to worse. There's a clue. After missing several sessions, another clue, where were you, sir, when these sessions, she's 10 years old. How did she miss sessions? Joy refuses to continue. Who's the parent here, sir, you or her? Joe says he's tried to persuade her, but Joy says no, ditto. The therapy re records contain these excerpts. Quote, therapy has not been successful. Joe supports Joy's relationship, with her mother, but Joan is defensive and refuses to accept responsibility for her contribution to the situation. Joan remains focused on divorce-related conflicts and accuses Joe of, quote, parental alienation, unquote. I told her I have not seen Joe do anything to alienate Joy, but Joan is convinced the main problem is PAS. She, Joan, is adamant and difficult to refocus. Doesn't your heart reach out to that poor therapist who's having so much frustration getting this misguided, targeted parent to understand that if she would only take responsibility for her contribution, everything would be fine. Well, right there, several important clinical patterns have been missed by the psychotherapist. In the vast majority of cases, this is what I read when I read the records. Um, I have some experts here. Am I exaggerating? No. Right, okay. This, if you under, this is not a hard pattern to recognize. Uh, I was once talking, I won't mention his name, but a very prominent editor who couldn't make it to this uh, meeting. And he said, you know, we, the experts really always get this right. I know it sounds a little cocky for me to say this, but we always get this right. His initials are RS. And I, I, I think that's true. I don't think any of the experts in this room would have failed to sit bolt upright in their chair after hearing this much. Okay, so the court uh, appoints three professionals, a clinical psychologist 
to do a custody evaluation, an attorney to serve as a guardian ad litem, or GAL, and an attorney for the child, uh, often called an attorney for the minor child, or an AMC. Um, six more months go by while they're doing their job, and I think these are important jobs. I, I, I really am sincerely feel a balanced approach here. Uh, although a lot of mistakes are getting made, I, I am absolutely not saying that anyone is malignant or stupid or greedy or any of that. There are occasional bad apples in every barrel, but I, I think for the most part this is an educational problem and it's a failure of pattern recognition and a triumph of system one over system two. Um, if your uh, only tool is a hammer, every problem tends to look like a nail. Um, meanwhile, Joy and Joan have had no contact, which is a very, very bad thing therapeutically. The rule here is you really don't want anything to interfere. And what most of the therapists say is, oh, well, it's too stressful for the child. I'll let you know when it's time for them to reunite. And that's a huge clinical error. And I, uh, if the day I meet a, a bona fide expert who believes that's a good idea will be the day I change my opinion about it. Now, if you look at the custody evaluator's report, you'll see a similar problem with pattern recognition and also over-reliance on what's called naive intuition in such cases. That doesn't mean you're a naive person. It just means untutored intuition. So an exact quote, Joe, 45, presents as calm and relaxed but duly concerned. Stop. As a forensic evaluator myself, I now already know something. I know that the custody evaluator is telling a short story and he's already decided to put one of the people on a pedestal. I, I see you nodding yes here, right? So it doesn't take, a few other people are nodding yes. A real expert's already saying, oh, he's going to tell a short story and I know who the, bad, the, good, the good guy is. So he's calm and relaxed and duly concerned. Mood and affect are appropriate to the situation. Insight and judgment are good. He appears to be reliable and credible. These are magic words. <laughs> Uh, although he describes diligent efforts to encourage Joy to spend time with her mother, he concedes those efforts have not been successful. Asked why, he replies, quote, now watch how good this makes him look. And just keep in mind who the author here is. This is being written by a custody evaluator who's trying to put the, uh, the actual perpetrator in a good light, but with the best of intentions. He doesn't realize he's got it backwards. I'm not sure. By the way, it's probably being delivered well. I'm not sure. I think it has something to do with her parenting style. She tends to give orders instead of explaining why Joy should do certain things. But, you know, I, I really don't know why Joy has rejected her mom. Well, if you believe that, there's a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to say. <laughs> um, now, it could be true, but I'm gathering data and I'm skeptical. I don't believe it, but I don't disbelieve it yet. Now let's see what's written about mom. Joan 40 presents as anxious and intense, pressure of speech and psychomotor agitation. She's a somewhat rambling and tangential historian. Okay, he's beating her up. That's what I'm thinking of, beating up the mother. She claims Joy has, quote, parental alienation syndrome, a controversial theory that has not been validated in clinical trials and that most experts believe is not a syndrome. Well, it may well be true, may or may not be true, that most experts believe it's not a syndrome, but those experts would clearly not understand the medical definition of a syndrome. Uh, but this also shows a, a type of academic bias. Uh, there are people out there giving courses who are saying this, and unfortunately some of them are giving courses to judges and psychotherapists and what have you. I don't really care what you call it, syndrome, non-syndrome, phenomenon, or even Fred, uh, but that's showing that he's skeptical and he's about to beat up the mom here, and he's already doing it. Uh, she's quite rigid about this and tried to convince me of that quote diagnosis, unquote, with respect to family dynamics. Her insight and judgment are somewhat impaired. She's not a bad parent but has blind spots. There's the token positive thing. For example, she fails to see her own contribution to her conflicts with joy. I won't ask anyone to raise a hand, but I'll bet you a, a majority of the uh, alienated target parents in this audience have had this done to them. Uh, anyone who's a forensic uh, writer, as I am, uh, I also used to run a, a forensic consulting group, and uh, I would work with people on how to write fair and balanced reports. That is what we didn't like to do, but unless someone, I see a few of you over there, other forensic experts nodding yes, this 
we, in an instant, we know what's being done here. This is a hatchet job. Um, next, Joy, the little independent thinker, will be coming. <laughs> Joy can, <laughs> is bright and personable. She presents as mature for her age. How mature could she be, really? Um, asked if she knows why she is here, she replied, quote, so I can tell you I don't want to see my mother, adding that her opinions are her own. <laughs> Probably adding spontaneously, and nobody told me to say that. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the evaluator, on a serious note, he thinks this, is a, this gives her more credibility. He thinks that he's trying to do a hatchet job on the mother. He wants the court to get his narrative. And he, he thinks this is actually helping his narrative that the young lady is mature and reassured him these are her thoughts. How hard is it to see through this? Well, it's hard, actually, if you've only seen one or two cases unless one of those cases was your own. But it's not hard if you've seen dozens of cases which every expert in this room has seen. Um, when discussing her family, I'm on the second paragraph, it appears Joy has an almost visceral dislike of her mother. Of this, she says, quote, she's not a good mother, she's verbally abusive. She's mean and she yells at me, unquote. Here's my question for you. Do 10-year-olds really talk that way? <laughs> Do you know any 10-year-olds? You know, why'd you get into that fight on the playground with Freddie? He was verbally abusive. To me. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you is the school principal? Who? They, don't they don't talk like that. There you go. It's been a while since I was 10. OK. Joy described several incidents in which her mother was verbally abusive, screaming for hours. Although some of her reports seem extreme, they were verified by her father. You know, I couldn't make this stuff up. That's the actual comment from a psychotherapist in an actual case. Seems extreme, but was verified with father. And I slapped my forehead so hard that this was red for days. Um, there was no evidence of coaching. Well, well, actually, sir, not only was there evidence of coaching, but it's right there in, in, in what you just showed me. I've got the independent thinker phenomenon. I've got borrowed scenarios. I've got an implausible situation from the get-go, and it's been missed. Um, and by the way, later I have a slide where people will say, oh, well, you know, you can't testify in this case, or Dr. Gottlieb, or Ms. Gottlieb can't testify, Dr. Darnell, Dr. Burnett, you, you can't, the expert can't testify because they haven't really interviewed the child or the other parent. Well, you know, it's nice to be able to do that, but it's not necessary if you've got this kind of high quality evidence in abundance. You know, I have a slide on this, so I won't get ahead of myself, but let me just say that I've been an expert witness in dozens of wrongful death cases, and let me tell you, if I needed to interview the dead guy before I could be there, no plaintiff would ever win a wrongful death case. Um, okay, so he recommends the custody evaluator full custody for the father and two weekly one hour supervised visits for the mother. He explains that he isn't sure Joy can tolerate more and advises that therapy should begin slowly. Joan, the mother, is devastated. This is a common clinical mistake. Uh, you know, you really don't want to be the one who now puts a further barrier between the targeted or alienated parent and, and the alienated abused child. Uh, the case proceeds to trial. Anyone want to guess whether it goes well? Um, after a prolonged trial, the judge adopts the custody evaluator's recommendations as noted above. Jones, devastated, looks forward to therapy. Lisa shall be seeing the kid. Understandable and a common scenario. Predictably, the therapy and the supervised visits fail. Nothing's been put in place to assure that they will work. Here's what should have been said. If the judge was going to make that decision, which the way I've rigged it shouldn't have been but I'll admit this is a composite hypothetical case. It should have said, Joe, Mr. Gray, I'm going to let you retain custody. And I'm ordering reunification therapy and supervised visits, which probably shouldn't have been supervised, maybe accompanied, maybe not. But you've already sent the kid the message that dad's dangerous, so that wasn't a good idea. But back to what the judge should have said, or perhaps uh, a mediator uh, or a GAL. I'll tell you something, though. I expect quick results. I'm going to meet back here in four weeks, in eight weeks, and in 12 weeks. 
And I'm pretty sure that there's been some alienation going on. So when we come back for the status conference to see how therapy's going, don't be telling me that, uh, well, I, you know, I've supported therapy, but gosh darn, uh, you know, I can't force her. I'm going to assume that if she's not fixed in a few weeks, if she's at least not headed in the right direction, you're probably continuing to alienate her. But wait, I might be wrong. If I'm wrong, that means this poor little girl is so far gone that even you yourself can't fix her anymore, which would be even more reason to go ahead with the reversal of custody as your former wife requested. Now, unfortunately, those types of orders don't usually happen. Those people who, uh, and I'm not a psychotherapist, so I rely on, on people like Linda Gottlieb, but when those orders are written with real teeth, they flip like a light switch, as both Linda and Brian said. Uh, it's a shame that people are afraid to do this. One of the things, a phrase that I've uh, kind of stolen from a former teacher is the timid clinician. And what you're really dealing with here is timid clinicians, uh, timid lawyers, timid judges, and what have you. They just are afraid to do it. And I understand that. I really do. But you have to sometimes in medicine learn when the treatment is counterintuitive. You know, if you're having a bad asthma attack and I'm giving you adrenaline, well, why would I do that? They already have a heart rate of 150. Well, because you treat the underlying condition and then the heart rate comes down. Uh, if you haven't had that type of training, it's hard for you to see your way clear to do this. So I'm not calling anyone, you know, deficient. I'm just saying this is a special situation and it needs special skills. So the therapy goes poorly. The therapist has focused on strengthening Joan's parenting skills. Joan will barely speak to either of the parents or the therapist, but excuse me, to the mother of the therapist. Uh, but the therapist can keep trying with the best of intentions, but this is not the right approach. By contrast, after six weeks, the visitation supervisor suspends the supervised visits, takes the mother aside and says, quote, this is the worst case of parental alienation I have ever seen. You need to go back to court and try to get full <coughs> custody. I will support you. The, the supervised, uh, well, the super, the, I can't say it. The visitation supervisor might even be a layperson but probably has much better pattern recognition because he or she does it all the time. The therapist probably hasn't seen a case this severe in his or her career, and if they have, it's a handful and it's not enough to draw inferences. Moderate cases are very different than severe cases in almost every way. And so uh, that's an interesting piece of data, but Joan can't go back to court because she's in the middle of a bankruptcy at this point. 100 and something thousand dollars. And this is very, very common, and I can almost bet dollars to donuts that some of you have been pushed into bankruptcy and still wound up being told, you know, he's perfect, she's rotten, even if you were not guilty of doing what they accused you of. So Joan concludes, I don't understand. And this is real. These are some of my clients have said things, and this is actually one of the clients in particular that I extracted it from. I don't understand. I thought if I just told the truth, if I just explained what was going on, everything would be okay. I thought the experts would take one look and understand that Joy was being abused, and then they would protect her. But they didn't understand. They didn't protect her. Instead of protecting her, they attacked me. You know, Joe can be very charming. He bamboozled them. How could this happen? How could this happen? And that's the question I'm trying to answer. And actually, just a question I'm in the process of answering. And it's not a surprise that it happens. Uh, in fact, it's what usually happens. If you take faulty pattern recognition and certain uh, hardwired biases, and you, and you ask that individual, whether a professional or not, to try to explain what's going on in a severe alienation case. Uh, at least, well, I don't want to give a real statistic, but to make up a number, I would say about 90% of the time, the professionals not only get it wrong, they get it backwards. And they get it backwards in a very predictable way. They get, it, they, they get it backwards with great confidence. And if you question them, they're quite sure. They've seen it right in front of them. They're, you know, I kicked the tires. I know what that is. I'll explain more in a moment, but it's a very common pattern. Meanwhile, the targeted parent is in a no-win double bind. This is an old Gary Larson cartoon. Come on, come on, it's either one or the other. Damned if you do damned if you don't. 
I was once talking to one of the absolute best psychotherapists I knew, and I said, how did you, you know, do you agree the mother's probably borderline? And he said, absolutely. And I said, well, you know, what was it that tipped you off? Uh, was it the screaming or the, you know, the neediness or the manipulative behavior? And he said, no, those are all very important, but the thing that impressed me most is everything she did created a no-win double bind for the father. And by the way, all my comments are gender neutral. That, that case just happened to be that way. And I think that's a really important indicator. It's a good clue you might be dealing with borderline personality disorder. They're not just manipulative. They put you in a no-win double bind to the point where it's genius, really. Everything they do is a no-win double bind. Okay, so how could this happen? What, what, what went wrong? Well, I, you're already well on the way. I'm going to formalize it a little bit more. Cognitive errors, clinical errors, legal errors. I've got to save some time, so I think I've covered that slide. But it's, again, a predictable pattern. Um, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem tends to look like a nail. The young doctor knows the rules. The old doctor knows the exceptions. I was taught this as a medical student. It's easy to learn the rules. That's why residents are overconfident when the exception comes along, and these cases are an exception to the usual rules. What are the usual rules? Both parties always participate. There's never one good parent and one bad parent. If you really believe that, you're probably not the right person to either be diagnosing or treating a case of severe parental alienation, nor are you the right person to be litigating it. I won't make any comments about adjudicating it. Um, only to keep myself on good terms with the judges. Um, another thing I was taught in school, many people who claim to go by the book have never read the book or even know which book. And that's also something that's very relevant here. These are some of what I think are the best resources for lay people and professionals. I'm starting with two books that I highly recommend for lay people. There are many others. Um, on the left is Doug Darnell's book, Divorce Casualties. Uh, it's also got a, a sequel, um, Beyond Divorce Casualties, that gets more into treatment. They're both superb. Another uh, individual invited to this con uh, conference couldn't make it is Dr. Richard Warshak. Uh, his is Divorce Poison, also superb. Uh, that's, I'd start buying both of those books if I were a targeted or alienated parent. Um, somewhat more appropriate to, well, this is on the line between professionals and parents. They're all, every book I'm showing you is good for both. But on the left is Linda Gottlieb's book, uh, The Parental Alienation Syndrome, Linda Gottlieb being the woman who was on the panel earlier. And uh, another superb uh, reference, um, Burnett, excuse me, Lorendos Burnett and Sauber, Dr. Burnett being that middle author, uh, Parental Alienation, the Handbook. And I, I use this, in, whenever I speak about this, I use this for lay audiences, I use this for lawyers, uh, and what have you. Another extremely valuable resource, by the way, Dr. Darnell has a wonderful chapter in that. I think yours is on mild alienation. Am I remembering that right? You know, yeah. uh, Brian Ludmer has some stuff in it. This, this has a terrific number of authors. And if you look, let's see if I can get my laser to work. Okay, right there, it's a CD with over a thousand references. The idea that somehow there's no research to support this, I'll agree that we could have better research. But I can tell you now, if they held your cardiologist or your oncologist, to the level that some people want to ha hold experts in alienation research, people would be dropping dead left and right uh, from cardiac and, and cancer conditions. You can't always have perfect studies. Evidence-based medicine does not mean you have a study for everything you do. It means you're using the best available evidence. And if the best available evidence is an elite panel of experts who collectively between them have seen thousands of cases uh, it is not good medical or clinical practice to ignore their advice, uh, as opposed to having no data, which of course is a problem. Okay, another very valuable resource, this one edited uh, by Amy Baker and Richard Sauber, uh, is working with alienated children and families. Uh, Dr. Bone has an excellent chapter there written with Sauber, I believe it is, right? Richard wrote that with you, right? So, so that's on the litigation expert. Uh, Linda Gottlieb, Chapter 11, superb on therapy, and, and basically says this is counterintuitive. You need to empower the targeted parent 
that parent needs to start being responsible, not disempowered, which is what most people do. Uh, you need to have teeth in your enforcement and so forth and so on, chapter 11. Chapter 5 is written by uh, Dr. Baker herself along with Paul Fine, who's a psychotherapist. And that describes the 17 alienation strategies that most of you are familiar with. And the last, uh, excuse me, the, actually the first chapter, uh, the second chapter after the introduction is by myself. And my favorite quote there from page 11 is, clinicians who attempt to manage such cases without adequate skills are likely to find themselves presiding over a cascade of clinical and psychosocial disasters. And I have a strong hunch that almost every targeted parent in this room could testify to the truth of that statement. This is not the type of a thing where you send in a novice to straighten it out. Okay, now I was talking earlier about hardwired cognitive errors. Um, my chapter is on clinical reasoning and decision making in, in what I call the guidebook, you know, a clinical guidebook for short, the guidebook. And uh, we almost, at her suggestion, we almost subtitled it hardwired to get this wrong. And her, her comment was that, you know, one thing I like about this chapter is um, it's really not blaming anyone. You know, it's an educational chapter. This is how smart people manage to get this wrong. And I was pleased to hear that because that was my intent. I'm not trying to beat up anyone here. I'm trying to say, hey, hang on a minute. This is counterintuitive. A whole different set of rules apply. It's as different as special relativity or general relativity are from Newtonian physics. Uh, you know, everything you know might be valid, just don't apply it to this when people are traveling at the speed of light or whatever. Sorry for my bot botched physics analogy there, but it's not a bad analogy. Um, Daniel Kahneman won the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on decision making and is really the founder and father of a field called heuristics and biases, which has to do with systematic biases and cognitive errors that we're pre-programmed to make. His longtime partner, Amos Tversky, would have surely uh, won the Nobel Prize with him, but uh, died in 1996. I had the privilege of uh, a mentor in medicine pulling me aside in 1974 and saying, this new article came out in Science that I think you should read. I think it's really appropriate to uh, what we're doing in, in, uh, in medicine. And, uh, that my mentor uh, eventually was an MD, PhD, JD, MPH. So this guy was really smart, Horace Martin. And uh, so at a fairly young age, I was introduced to this field and, and I've been watching it unfold for 40 years. There is no better reference than this book that Kahneman finally published in 2011 for lay people, Thinking Fast and Slow. The fast is your intuitive system one, make snap judgments, they're usually right, Sometimes they're wrong, and when they're wrong, watch out. And the slow analytical thinking, system two, uh, that's your analytical brain. It's lazy. You have to recruit it. It doesn't want to go to work. You've got to make it do a rational override if system one has not done its job. And if you understand that, it's not hard to explain these cases. Uh, a common question I'm asked is, Dr. Miller, come on now. There are six court-appointed experts here, three court-appointed experts, whatever. You know, we got a, an attorney for the minor child, we got a custody evaluator, we got a court-appointed therapist. How could they all get this wrong and one expert from wherever, you know, Canada, New York, Florida, how could that person be right? <clears throat> the answer, to quote a, uh, so another physician, Rick Bucata, who lives here in California, hello, Rick, um, Three third graders don't make a ninth grader. <laughs> I went to a medical meeting a couple months ago and he was there and I said, you know, Rick, I'm Steve Miller, remember me? He said, oh, sure, I remember. He didn't remember. I said, you know, I get this, these tapes that you uh, put out. I've been listening to them for 30 something years. And years ago, you said three third, or three third graders don't don't make a ninth grader, and uh, I've been using that for like 25 years, you know, I just want, did you make that up, or is that a medical effort? No, I made that up. <laughs> so uh, he deserves some credit. That explains these cases. I don't mean any disrespect by that, by the way, it's something that's caught on, and we actually say it now in medicine. So the field of heuristics and biases basically looks at the two systems. A heuristic is a rule of thumb, or these domain-specific heuristics are rules of thumb, they often work, 
but they don't always work. Uh, the hardwired judgment heuristics are inborn. Uh, they lead to systemic, or systematic, I should say, biases, and those are basically cognitive errors or thinking errors. Uh, since they're hardwired, they feel natural, and they are very hard to override. I see myself making them, and I try to override them, and I'm not always successful. It's really hard. Um, let's look at a few of the more famous. Um, Kahneman Tversky named this in the early 70s the availability heuristic. It simply refers to making decisions based on how easy it is to retrieve something from memory, how available it is. Um, if there was a plane crash last week, you're likely to think more about getting on a plane than if you hadn't read a recent news of a plane crash. Just natural. Um, next, the availability errors occur if what you're thinking of isn't necessarily relevant to the situation at hand. You, you may have some faulty pattern recognition, or it may be a rather famous case, but not a common one. You know, the actual uh, chance of dying in a plane crash is one in 2.5 million. But if I read the newspaper last week about one, I have trouble getting on the plane myself. Um, the next heuristic they named in the early 70s was the representativeness heuristic. I'd like to rename this. Uh, they sometimes call it the um, similarity uh, heuristic or the stereotyping heuristic. It just means you're stereotyping. Oh, I've seen this before. These cases are all the same. You know, he says this, she says that. The truth is in the middle. Bad mouth in each other. Oh, I've seen a million of those. That's what the judges are thinking. And unfortunately, this is the exception to the rule. That's like saying uh, that, you know, well, I've seen these rape victims before. And she must have done something to deserve it. There'd be shock, outrage, and a firestorm if anyone was foolish enough to say that nowadays. But when it's an alienation case, people actually do use similar reasoning. And that's really not fair to the innocent targeted parent. Uh, even if perhaps they're not 100% innocent, they didn't start the fight and they're doing their best to cope with it. Uh, so representativeness errors occur when, again, flawed pattern recognition, you may be dealing with an exception to the rule. Um, finally, anchoring errors means what it sounds like. You get anchored to your initial hypothesis. Uh, originally, it was called anchoring and adjustment. still is insufficient adjustment. As new data comes in, you're already <coughs> anchored. Now, when you analyze what goes wrong in these cases, you can really make use of these concepts. Um, a therapist meets the parent, jumps to a conclusion based on the availability and representative heuristics, now is starting to get anchored. The next thing that will happen then is uh, the confirmation bias will kick in, but I'm going to get to that in a second. I just want to show you, this is from original data by Tversky and Kahneman in the science article from 74. That whole article is reproduced in the back of Thinking Fast and Slow. Terrific read, very accessible to lay people. They're great writers. They took high school students and asked them, uh, What's the product if you multiply that line of things together, one times two times three times four, and then they asked a different group, what's the product if you do that one? The group that was asked the first question estimated 512. The group that was asked the second question estimated a little over 2200, 2250. The actual answer is greater than 40,000, so none of the students were even in the ballpark. But the, the take home point is you are anchored to the one. A simple mathematical thing, no emotion, no alienation, no child abuse, no nothing. The group that saw a one first gave an answer one quarter as big as the group that saw an eight first. That is anchoring. And it is a powerful human hardwired bias. Uh, now confirmation bias kicks in, which basically means that you're only going to pay attention to information that supports your hypothesis. And you're going to disregard information that doesn't. This is a terrible clinical mistake. And it's very important. You know, I, for many years, I supervised medical students and residents. And I would jump all over confirmation bias. It's a leading cause of malpractice cases as well. And it can be extreme, so extreme that I can see cases. Look at that. There's 10 or 20 pieces of disconfirmatory evidence. And the custody evaluator or the therapist is focusing on one or two pieces of confirmatory evidence because it feels good and it supports what they believe in the first place. Uh, but it's a very serious clinical error, especially because 
disconfirmatory evidence is generally far more powerful than confirmatory evidence. No, how, no matter how many white sheep you have, uh, excuse me, white swans, you can't prove that all swans are white. Show me a single black swan and I've just disconfirmed the hypothesis. Uh, so this kicks in. Next, the fundamental attribution error. I have only memorized three pages in the chapter I wrote in the guidebook. Page 11 for the quote I showed you about clinical and psychosocial disasters. Page 29, because the bottom paragraph is about the fundamental attribution error, and the top of page 30, which will be the next slide. The fundamental attribution error is the single most important thing for a targeted or alienated parent to know, a rejected parent to know about this whole situation, especially if you're going to have an interview with anyone, your own lawyer, a custody evaluator, a psychotherapist. So what is it? Well, it's been in the medical literature for about 37 years, uh, the psychological literature. It means that you assume that a situation, when an observer is dis observing behavior, that a situation is internal when in fact it's external, or putting it in more common terms, you're confusing um, something that is actually situational to be dispositional or characterological. This runs rampant through the field. It is an enormous problem. And the reason it's the most important thing for a parent to know is don't expect the evaluator whether it's your own lawyer or custody evaluator, anybody, don't expect them to make allowances for you. They can't do it. They're hardwired not to do it. If you see an angry person, you don't say, wow, I wonder if he's just having a bad day. You know, guys venting, storming around, stop, right? We say, oh, I'm keeping away from that guy. There's an angry man. 10,000 years ago, if you walked up to that guy and said, hey, can I help? You know, you might get killed. So it's hard for anyone to overcome that. And if you're going into an evaluation, you need to be calm and pleasant. You need to control you know, your anger, however justified. Um, so I don't want to belabor the point, but it's a really big deal to understand this because the judge is likely to be making the fundamental attribution error as well. Um, Partly, this is due to attribute substitution, which also is something we see with true heuristics. You really can't tell if someone is uh, guilty or not in court, so maybe you'll substitute which parent do I like better, which parent conducts himself or herself better. And if the other parent is conducting him or herself well, and you're seething with rage and resentment, don't expect to win your case as much as you might deserve to. Um, okay. Finally, for cognitive errors, uh, it's, this is kind of a fancy name for a simple concept. Dr. Baker just didn't walk in. She thinks I've spent the whole time talking about cognitive errors. No, I've only spent about 10 minutes on it, believe it or not. But this is a big one for attorneys and for clinicians. It simply and it comes from Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky's work. We are not hardwired to do statistics very well. Kahneman describes himself as a poor statistical thinker, at least prior to being educated about statistics. And we give too much weight to the evidence right in front of us and too little weight to the facts. So if you're a clinician, you think you can figure this out with an interview. Um, you talk to the people. He says this, she says that. He's all calm, cool, and collected. She's all agitated and angry. And you got it all figured out. But you're probably wrong. The base rate would be to consider what's the prior probability of this being true? What's the prior probability that everyone was getting along fine until 11 months ago? One party filed for divorce. The other party didn't. The child is 14 years old, has had a documented good relationship with the parent for 14 years, or at least 13 years, and all of a sudden now has no contact whatsoever with that parent in the absence of any credible allegation, let alone established abuse or neglect. Not high. So this principle is important for clinicians to understand. 
you you know many clinicians most clinicians put too much weight on what they think they see in front of them and not enough weight to the prior probability um, one can never make any uh, probabilistic draw any probabilistic conclusion without considering both the evidence and the prior probability even if you say to a patient how old are you if i were to tell someone i'm 13 uh, they would realize that the prior probability of that being true is just so low that, uh, you know, I could tell them all kinds of things about how I age badly. But <laughs> you would know that, you know, the same for moon of, made of green cheese. You know, Neil Armstrong could walk in here with a piece of green cheese and tell you he personally got it from the moon. It, it, you would not believe him. And the reason you wouldn't believe him is prior probability. So when you neglect base rate, that's bad for a clinician. It's just as bad for attorneys um, I've been working with a few of the people uh, in the audience on, on these cases, and if the pretest probability, the prior probability, is 1% that you can win the case, what makes you think you're in that 1% if you're the attorney? People like Brian Ludmer and Michael Bone and Doug Darnell and Bill Burnett and Linda Gottlieb say, you know, even when it's a legitimate case, and Amy Baker, it's very difficult to win these cases. Why is it difficult? Well, cognitive errors, clinical errors. But you can't win the cases without massive, overwhelming evidence, and you can't win them without explaining to the court what's really going on. It isn't just going to fall out of the trees for you. That's base rate neglect. You think you can win it with the usual dog and pony show because you're a custody lawyer and you've been doing this for a long time, and you're going to do your dog and pony show for the court, and you will lose if it fails to explain that this is child abuse and that this is parental alienation and if you don't bring in an, an expert to give some expert testimony to convince the judge you're not just making it all up because you're a lawyer. ISNAP is developing a nice glossary which isn't ready for prime time yet, but I'm one of the people who's been tweaking a little bit. And so I'm going to show you what I think are non-controversial definitions, just enough to get us you know, using a shared language and have a shared database. Child alignment is a neutral term. It just means the child is favoring one parent over another. It doesn't carry any connotations that the child is alienated versus estranged. Alienation means that the child is strongly aligned with one parent over another for no good or valid reason. If there's a good or valid reason, you shouldn't be using the term. Estrangement means the child's strongly aligned for a good and valid reason. Uh, but this is where you start getting into trouble where people who are not real experts, self-proclaimed experts, uh, get it wrong. Uh, you need, to call it estrangement, you need bona fide abuse, neglect, or markedly deficient parenting skills. Children don't reject the parent because she's not a good listener. <laughs> or, you know, she gave me timeouts. She gives me timeouts. Okay? That doesn't really happen unless there's an alienating influence. So if you're going to call it estrangement, the bar is not really low. Um, first of all, it has to be clinically significant. Whatever is going on, if there is any bad behavior, it has to be clinically significant contributing behavior, and it has to be temporally connected. Uh, in one case I'm familiar with, after not seeing the kids for two years, a parent put up a billboard that said parental alienation is child abuse. And suddenly the kids said, that's why we don't want to see Dan. <laughs> well, I took eighth grade logic, as you all did, if event B follows event A, event B probably didn't cause event A. <laughs> so, you know, when I see the therapist getting this backwards, sometimes it's like, really? How, how could that really be? It didn't happen until three years later. Uh, you can, of course, have a mixture of alienation and estrangement. It's commonly called a hybrid. Um, they're both present. But you can't just say both parents participated. If he participated 99%, and he's the instigator, and she participated 1% because she didn't handle it well, or you know, even if it's, uh, well, make it 90-10, you know, you have to carefully grade the severity here. W you know, did one of these parents start the fight um, and perpetuate it and, and is determined to destroy the child's relationship with the other parent? What kind of behavior are you accusing the rejected parent of displaying? Uh, when the cases are done right, there's true estrangement. Well, each one of them was calling the other one an a-hole. All right, I'll buy it. It's a hybrid. But if what's really gone on is that the, the targeted or the alienated parent 
simply had maladaptive coping skills, dysfunctional reactions to what was happening. I've never seen a targeted parent who wasn't dysfunctional. Who wouldn't be? It's not normal. Your child's being abused, you know, by an aggressive, vindictive person. Um, who would sit there calmly and, and quietly and not seem stressed out? Or, you know, I know at least two psychotherapists who became targeted parents, and they were terrible. They were just awful in terms of their instincts and what they wanted to do about it. So, you know, you have to sort these things out. And that's what I'm about to show you in a slide coming up. Okay, so to qualify as a true hybrid, first of all, you need estrangement behavior, not just suboptimal parenting. And then you, you need it to reach a certain level. One thing to look at is if it's real estrangement, is it primary or secondary? Primary estrangement, and this is by medical definition, there's no controversy about these terms in medicine. You know, we have primary conditions, secondary conditions. The, if the primary condition is estrangement from one parent, and then it, you develop estrangement from the other parent, I'll buy it. It's a true hybrid. But still, I'd like to make a distinction between the parent who started the war and the parent who is now indeed estranging the child by showing anger or, or other dysfunctional behavior. To add here is then I think you have to grade the severity of the behavior. So, you know, you could have both parents participated, but I'm not going to call it a hybrid because the participation was rather mild and it came later and, and it, I don't think it was causally connected. Then you could have real estrangement, but it's secondary estrangement, mild or not so mild. Or you could have a true hybrid where they're both participating in a very significant way. If you're not getting that, it's okay. I just want to throw that out there. But it, you, know, you can't just say, oh, both parties always participate and be right. You, you have to be seeing some of these finer nuances. Otherwise, it's sloppy at best, sloppy medicine, sloppy clinical practice. Okay, just a few more terms. Uh, favored parent is the, just another way of saying the child with uh, the parent with whom the child is aligned. Some people also would use the term preferred parent, as I have on the bottom. I don't really make a distinction, but some people say, well, they don't really prefer the other parent; they're just favoring the other parent. I don't know if I hurt my leg and I favor the other leg. I, I, I guess there's some validity to that. I don't necessarily prefer the other leg, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm a doctor, you know, I, ha I don't always agree with this, but I have to acknowledge some people have different terms. I don't have a problem, whatever you call it. Um, rejected parent, though, is a neutral term. You can be rejected for a reason, a good reason, not a good reason. You shouldn't be using rejected parent synonymously with an alienated or a targeted parent. Targeted parent is a parent who has been targeted for alienation. It doesn't necessarily mean that alienation has occurred yet. Now, uh, Dr. Baker had to point this out to me the other day when I was ready to approve this as a synonym for alienated parent. And she said, well, I hate to tell you, what if they're targeted, but it hasn't stuck yet? And, oh, you're right. So you can make that distinction. I don't have a big problem with people who use the term a little bit loosely to mean the alienated parent. But it's good to know that, strictly speaking, you could be targeted and not yet alienated. And then alienated parent is alienated parent. You've been targeted. If the child is rejecting you, you got the full kit and caboodle. Um, now a couple of more um, complicated terms. Pathological enmeshment, one of the panelists or more used that term earlier. This is a big deal. Uh, Linda Gottlieb uh, worked for 10 years and trained for close to 10 years with a child psychiatrist by the name of Sal Mnuchin, who coined the term enmeshment, and who, according to Linda, would say pathological enmeshment is redundant, because all enmeshment is pathological. Basically refers to an unhealthy fusion of the personalities and the psyches of the parent with the child. Uh, it's a, a severe boundary violation. Uh, the child becomes psychologically and emotionally entangled with the parent. Some people would say the parent is co-opt or hijacked the child. All of these are good terms. Uh, the child loses identity, individuality, autonomy, sense of self, critical reasoning skills. This is a very serious uh, medical urgency. Uh, it, it borders on a medical emergency if the child is losing a sense of identity. 
And, you know, most lawyers trying the case, they don't really see this as a big deal. Uh, mental health professionals, yeah, the kid's getting enmeshed. You know, yeah, I agree, there's some enmeshment there. This is a very bad thing for future development of a child. And you usually see it, I mean, severe alienation almost goes hand in hand with pathological enmeshment. So if you're seeing signs of enmeshment, you're probably dealing with severe alienation. Now, I do have to warn people. You could have enmeshment with no alienation, but you rarely would find alienation without enmeshment. And it's a common mistake to confuse the probability of A given B with the probability of B given A. I can, I've seen many cases where parents were enmeshed with their children, and they, the mother was a widow. There was, no, there was no alienation. The mother just used the child as a proxy, and the child became close. And, you know, so don't think that, that, that this is synonymous. But when you have severe alienation, uh, one of the major clues is you'll have signs of enmeshment. And uh, enmeshment uh, is characterized by mainly three things, other than the fact that you can tell these people are, are intertwined. Uh, infantilization, the parents often infantilize the child, treat the child as being uh, younger than appropriate for developmental age. Um, adultification, older is appropriate. Um, well, yeah, I wish uh, <clears throat> I'd like to get little Susie into therapy, but she simply says no. Well, Mr. Gray, you know, or Joy, you know, Mr. Gray, the child is 10. Okay, uh, well, you know, I, I, uh, I discussed the divorce. <laughs> with my children and uh, they said uh, we well, really should divorce mom because we just can't stand her anymore. So, you know, the kids convinced me to do that. Really? How old were the kids? 12 and 14. Okay, this is an extreme, really extreme violation of boundaries. It's inappropriate uh, on the surface. It's also a sign of pathological enmeshment, parentification and adultification. So just a couple of points I didn't pick up in the other slides. Well, we beat this to death. PA is child abuse, psychological and emotional abuse, um, severe alienation, severe child abuse, and uh, psychological and emotional abuse is at least as damaging to a child as physical abuse. Just for the heck of it, I happen to have Amy Baker, Dr. Amy Baker in the audience. Have I overstated that Dr. Baker, who's written 99 papers, uh, peer-reviewed papers on child maltreatment, You were just supposed to say yes, you agree completely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've heard this from her so many times. I know she agrees. I never ask a question I don't know the answer to, just in case you didn't know it. Um, okay. Um, there are exceptions. We, we talked about this earlier, and your name came up. You know, if the kid's being beaten with a baseball bat, you know, there's exceptions. We just don't want people to think that, oh, it's only, it's only emotion. Okay. Let's look at a little logic. How many people agree, all men, this is a true syllogism, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is, is mortal. Is that a valid statement? Yes. We don't have time, I'm going to save it. Yes, duh. Okay, how about this? Children who have been abused by a parent reject that parent. This child has rejected a parent. Therefore, this child has been abused. Now, it doesn't quite leap out at you, does it? Is this, how many people think this is a valid, logical statement? Well, good for you, not a hand in the room went up. How many people think it is an invalid statement? Okay, uh, and how many of you don't care? <laughs> okay, um, well, it's clearly invalid, but try this. The president lives in a White House. I live in a White House, therefore I am the president. <laughs> okay, now I, I could, you know, I, I, I've taught clinical logic for 35 years, and I could tell you that this is decision-making based on common predicates, and you know, the verb and the thing here is a predicate, lives, White House, predicate, predicate, oh, I could also say it's called affirming the consequent, which you don't have to remember, but this is a well-known logical fallacy, you know, if A, then B, B, therefore A, it's just wrong, but, but if, you, if you then look back to the one about the uh, children, this, it, it, this is what is being done by custody evaluators and courts and others. So, uh, you know, we, we laugh at it when I show you the identical version in the white, with the White House, uh, but uh, it's a very uh, troubling era in logic. 
And the other problem with that is that it's based on a false premise to begin with. Children who have been abused by a parent don't usually <laughs> reject that parent. So it's a, it's a double problem. Um, in fact, what they do, as Linda Gottlieb explained, is they protect, defend, and cling to the abusive parent. If you want to know who's the probable abuser, just look to who the kid is defending and clinging to. In a genuine abuse case, it'll be a genuine abuser. In a parental, parental alienation case, if it's a severe one, it will be the alienating parent. It's a very simple rule, and it, it's got very good predictive value. Not 100%, but actually quite good. Now, I, I almost cut this out, but I can do it quickly enough. Um, one, it, it introduces something in a fun sort of way. And uh, I'm stealing this example from a psychologist by the name of Ward Edwards, who published a very similar example in 1968. It's called The Book Bag Poker Chip Problem. It, it, if I have a minor contribution to this discussion, it's that I believe this is extremely relevant to clinical reasoning and decision making, not just in alienation, but in general. What most clinicians do less well than certain things is weighting multiple pieces of evidence and then combining them to support or refute their hypothesis. Most clinicians are very good at pattern recognition, and if they make a mistake, it'll be because they ran into an exception to the rule that's the case in almost every malpractice case I've ever reviewed, which is several hundred <coughs> malpractice cases. And if you look for the, the exception to the rule, that explains the malpractice. Less obviously is that most clinicians are not all that good at properly weighting and combining evidence to support a clinical hypothesis. So let's see how we do. I want you to assume that I have two book bags, which is an old-fashioned term for a computer bag. And I was hoping for a laugh there. Um, and you, it's opaque, and I've put 1,000 poker chips in each bag. One bag has 750 red and 250 blue. The other bag, 250 red and 750 blue, the opposite. And I ask you to pick a bag. Now, if you just pick a bag, you can't see which is which. It's an opaque bag. If you just pick a bag, what's the probability that you would have picked the mostly red chip bag? 25%. 50 50. You don't know which bag it is. You're picking one at random, 50-50. So our prior probability for the red bag, the pretest probability here, is one to one, 50-50, and that's the answer. It's not a trick question. No. I wanted to lay a little groundwork. Now let's look at some evidence, which could be 12 pieces of evidence that it's alienation versus estrangement, and some of the evidence could be conflicting. Well, mom did yell at the kids one day and, you know, call them, you know, you little rascals, <laughs> in an unpleasant tone of voice. So let's say that we draw 12 chips, and you replace it each time, so there's always 1,000 chips in the bag. But reach in, red, blue, red, etc., And I get eight red chips and four blue chips. Eight red, four blue. Now the question is, what is the probability that you pick the mostly red chip bag? And I, I'm actually going to ask people to uh, raise hands. How many of you think the probability, you got eight red, four blue, right? How many people the think the probability is less than 50-50? That you got the red bag. Okay, a few. How many people think the probability is at least greater than 50-50 that the eight red and four blue suggests you're probably drawing from the red, mostly red bag? Okay. How many people would put that probability between 50 and 60%? How many people would say now the probability of the mostly red bag is 60 to 70 percent? Remember, eight red, four blue. 60 to 70 percent. Okay. How many would say 70 to 80 percent probability of mostly red? Is any, did, in case anyone didn't raise their hand. So am I right? No one in the room thinks the probability is greater than 80 percent. Is there anyone who thinks it's greater than 80? Not a person in the room. Okay. This is very instructive because the probability is 99%. And this is a great example of how we are poor statistical thinkers. My dream would be for Dr. Kahneman to be watching this talk and to call me on the phone and say, so glad you pointed that out, Dr. Miller. Or maybe Dr. Edwards. But, but in fact, this is a very common problem if you look at mistakes being made in alienation cases. There is massive overwhelming evidence that it's alienation. And the therapist or the custody evaluator or the attorney for, for the minor child is saying, oh, I don't know. I don't know. The, uh, 
The child seems so convinced that it really happened. You got 38 pieces of evidence here, and I can actually show you mathematically <laughs> that the probability is one in 760,000. But they're still making the fundamental attribution error and base rate neglect, and they're still anchored to the idea that, no, 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 I got it right, because the kid seems so credible. 99%, okay? And not one person in the room thought it was higher than 80. This is an exact good match for, for disregarding massive evidence that you're dealing with alienation. And I just want to conclude with a sound bite. What, what that means is that the person has not been properly waiting and combining the evidence to come at an actual realistic probability. Um, nothing is more deceptive than an obvious fact. Sherlock Holmes. If I could only have given one segment of this talk, it would have been on what I've been calling the dirty dozen. And I now have 13 examples for the dirty dozen, making it what? A baker's dozen. A baker's dozen. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Baker. OK. So this, I've shared this with several other people at this point. And what we're saying to attorneys is, look, the court needs to know all 12 or 13 of these. If you don't tell the court any one of them, you're really asking for trouble. It's asking too much to expect anyone, even a judge, even a seasoned, smart, brilliant judge, to connect the dots. So let me show you what I think they are. There are 12 things or 13 that are profoundly counterintuitive. Number one, most mental health professionals simply lack the clinical expertise to properly diagnose or treat parental alienation. Parental alienation is a complex medical problem. Severe alienation. Yet many clinicians who consider themselves experts in alienation estrangement reject the medical model. Now I understand why they do that. They're family systems people, and they say, oh, we're not going to pathologize the child, or, you know, it's not, it's not a syndrome, it's not medical. Well, that may be true for mild alienation, and it less possibly might be true for moderate. It is absolutely not true for severe alienation. I'm not saying to go bring in Dr. Burnett that you need a psychiatrist. I'm saying you have to think medically, that's all. Don't reject the medical model. In a severe case, you're probably dealing with some genuine medical delusions. You know, uh, first of all, the alienated parent in a severe case has a very high probability of having a personality disorder. With borderline narcissistic or some sociopathic or a combination. The probability of that is well over 90%. I could probably show you mathematically it's closer to 100. If you're actually dealing with severe alienation, I, I haven't said how you would know that. Just, you know, assuming that somehow there's a gold standard, there's a blood test for it, this is unequivocally severe alienation, then normal people don't do that to their children. It's, it's not counterintuitive, actually. It's just think of it properly. So, and you're dealing with all kinds of things that goes along with that. Uh, one, the single most difficult thing to treat in all of psychiatry is sociopathic. Uh, well, it's, there isn't sociopathic personality disorder, but sociopaths. Uh, no one's ever reported with a genuine psychopath or sociopath a true treatment success. If they have, I await your data. Uh, and uh, they think they have. Um, borderlines is very difficult to treat until about 1993 or maybe 89. Uh, when Marshall Linehan reported some good outcomes, uh, it was considered almost untreatable. And her outcomes are not cures, they're remissions. So it, these are very difficult things to treat, and they're medical. The severe, they're medical, with suicide attempts, delusional thinking, severe cognitive distortions, severe emotional dysregulation, extreme bizarre behavior. I just described the book line there to you. And narcissists are also very similar. Sociopaths lack, uh, you know, basically lack of conscience. Uh, and lack empathy and so forth. These are not treatable things. If you think you can fix that with dyadic therapy, meaning two people talking to each other, or, uh, well, how did that make you feel? Um, you know, I, and you're a psychotherapist. I await your day. Good luck to you with that. Okay? This is a medical problem. And, and people ask me, how could this happen? Well, you have a severe medical problem, and there's been no medical input. So, um, all right, look, let me show you the dirty dozen, and we'll call it a day. Um, Number two, the clinical literature contains a great deal of false and misleading information. The literature is thoroughly polluted by people with PhDs and other credible credentials. 
Uh, and uh, you really can't go to the literature and think you've got a good review article. Someone referred to uh, a problematic article from 2001. I, can't, I don't have time to go into detail, uh, but that particular article essentially says we're not going to use a medical model, a very unfortunate uh, suggestion for the severe cases. Um, much of this false information is ideologically based. It's not science, it's a belief system. Um, one example is the idea this is not a syndrome. Here is the DSM definition of a syndrome. It's unchanged from the DSM-4 and the DSM-5. A grouping of signs and symptoms based on their frequent co-occurrence that may, the underlying is mine, suggest a common underlying pathogenesis, course, familial pattern, or treatment selection. Uh, since may is optional, if you remove the may, you have a grouping of signs and symptoms based on their frequent co-occurrence. If that isn't the description of an alienated child, I don't know what is. Richard Gardner was a professor, professor of psychiatry. <coughs> the people who are criticizing him have no medical training. Um, this is an untenable to say it's not a syndrome, but as I said earlier, I still don't use the word because I have better things to do with my time than debate it. However, here is a typical excerpt from a medical textbook. This is the actual book. Uh, I used an earlier edition, but every medical student I've ever met uses the Gowan's Diagnostic Exam uh, for learning physical diagnosis and other basic principles. For thousands of years, physicians have recorded recurrent patterns of disordered bodily structure, function, and mentation that suggest a common cause. Each pattern receives a specific name. When a common etiology, which means cause, and pathophysiology are confirmed, we designate the condition a disease. Other clusters of attributes known by a combination of features not clearly related to a single cause are called syndromes. The people who say it's not a syndrome, they say, oh, we, 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 it's, you know, it's not a disease. It doesn't have to be a disease. That's the whole point. Um, and nor does the DSM call it a disease. All right, number three. You simply can't assume that the rejected parent must have done something to deserve it. This is another common problem. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the text because I don't think it's really important. Um, Four, abused children typically align with the abusive parent, not the non-abusive parent. Um, the alienating parent is usually the custodial parent, and the child's not a captive, you know, please the custodial parent or else. Uh, so the child must go along to get along. Number five, alienating parents present well. Targeted parents usually present poorly. The main reason for that is the fundamental attribution error. He comes in with his personality disorder. Again, I'm using gender neutral terms. He comes in with his personality disorder. And if he's a borderline, a narcissist, or a sociopath, he's a master manipulator. He's charming. He's cool, calm, credible, convincing, charming. Um, the other parent, the targeted parent, the alienated parent, is a trauma victim and comes in all stressed out. So I made up an acronym. I say that alienate, I made this up, I'm real proud of this. I, I, I say that the alienating parents present with the four C's. They're cool, calm, charming, and convincing. And that the alienating, alienated parents who are trauma victims, they present with the four A's. They're anxious, angry, agitated, and afraid. If you don't have that pattern, you're going to think he's perfect, she's rotten. And it's kind of the other way around. Now, that's a great example and the best I know of flawed pattern recognition. To any expert in this room, we know that parent comes in, oh, yeah, she's all stressed out, falling apart. She's the victim. Most psychotherapists think, oh, well, no wonder the kids don't get along with her. Look at her. She's like, you know, she's a whack job. No, she's got PTSD or something quite like it. Okay, number six. To most non-specialists, pathological enmeshment looks like healthy bonding, a nice, warm, good, close, warm, loving relationship. Well, it's not. It's pathological measurement. It's a life-threatening, potentially life-threatening medical emergency. I can show you the statistics on that. The incidence of suicide among, you know, troubled children is substantially higher than it would be among non-troubled children. It's the third leading cause of death in children. Time does not permit me to elaborate, but it is a potentially life-threatening condition, and it gets mistaken for healthy bonding. That's the single most important thing I would ever tell a psychotherapist. Seven, the key point is not how strongly the child has rejected the parent, but rather why. I almost don't have to say a word about that. The stronger the child has rejected the parent, 
the less likely it is to be uh, true estrangement or abuse or neglect. You know, if the kid's severely um, rejecting the parent for trivial reasons, the more severe, the less credible. Um, another part of this is very important, the ability to reason backwards from cause to effect. And this is another skill that many of the evaluators don't have, whether they're lawyers or clinicians. Uh, let me quote my hero, Sherlock Holmes, on this. In solving a problem of this sort, the grand thing is to be able to reason backward. That is a very useful accomplishment and a very easy one, but people don't practice it much. That's from the very first Sherlock Holmes story in 1887. This is at the heart of clin clinical practice, and yet I frequently have read custody evaluations where the evaluator says, I don't care if blah, 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 you know, I have not seen it myself. Or I don't care what the kid's doing. If we, we haven't seen the father alienate, I'm not going to say there's alienation. Well, if you've got red chips all over the place, you can certainly do a probability call. And if the probability call is like 99.8%, you probably ought to think it's probably alienation. So this is important. If you apply this to alienation, I think I just really said this, you've got to look for evidence of alienation in the child. This would be Gardner's eight manifestations. Uh, if you are lucky enough to see Dr. Baker's 17 strategies or behaviors, great, but you don't necessarily need them. You like them, but if, if you've got other things, uh, that's important as well. And also if the targeted parent's done nothing to deserve it, that's a third piece of evidence. I said this earlier, but I'll highlight it here. Courts will sometimes say, or opposing counsel will say, how can Dr. So-and-so testify she's never seen the kid, or she never interviewed the other parent. You don't need that. What you need is adequate evidence for the issues before this court. And if you've got chart after chart after chart, then you probably have adequate evidence. It should, to get technical, it should go to weight, not admissibility, but I'd give it a lot of weight, too. Uh, eight, it's not difficult to induce a child to reject the parent. It's actually quite easy in adults uh, to induce behavior. Um, it's easy to instill false memories as well. So people think, well, you know, they think it's improbable. It's not improbable. Um, success in school or extracurricular activities does not mean a child's doing well, either inwardly or in general. Uh, many kids find a safe haven in school. Ten out of 13. Severe alienation is fundamentally different than moderate alienation. This is critical for therapists because they think they've seen several cases, but they saw mild to moderate alienation. And since it's the worst case they ever saw, they think that they now have seen severe alienation. But if you talk to people like the panelists today, they would tell you uh, they are as different as night and day. And I like to make a breast cancer analogy. You know, breast cancer is breast cancer, but if you have a tiny lump right here and I can remove it and you're cured with a lumpectomy, that's one thing. If I have metastatic disease, you know, in the brain, the bones, and the liver. That's a whole other thing. And by the way, you don't want to let the first one go to the second one. So they're very, very different, and I think failure to recognize this is a very common problem. Um, for example, when I say reunification therapy uh, doesn't work, which is my next slide, I'm only talking about the severe cases. It might work in a mild case. It's very important to grade severity. Okay, number 11. Reunification therapy should rarely, if ever, be the top priority. The top priority is to protect the child from further child abuse. And how many times have people in this room seen everyone talking about, we need to get the kid back with little Johnny, you know, or little Johnny back with the father, or whatever it is. Well, yeah, that's a very important thing, and there's ways of doing that that uh, we all know about. But that's not the top priority. You've got ongoing child abuse in the house. The top priority is to protect children from child abuse. In my chapter in Dr. Baker's book, uh, I have a nice quote from Richard Warshak. Dr. Warshak's book was on the screen earlier, saying, you know, this, our standard in this society is, to, our priority is to protect children from child abuse. That seems to have been lost. It's a, an excellent example of a misunderstanding of priorities in clinical or legal practice. Uh, another, of the, the second to last of the dirty dozen, in severe cases, conventional reunification therapy never works. If anyone has a bona fide documented severe case where you've made it work well, then I await your data. I can't find that case. I keep asking people who 
credibly tell me they've treated 2,000, 1,000, or more of these cases. You just can't put that kid on a couch and start to say, well, how did that make you feel? These are very complicated cases. Now, I'm not saying the key word there is con severe and conventional. Um, some of the people do have some successes, but they do it in a very different way. They empower the target parent. They're really teeth in it. They tell the, the other parent, don't be back here in four weeks telling me it's not your fault because I know better. Uh, and uh, that's night and day. Um, worse, it makes things worse. It's worse than worthless. Usually, if you order this type of therapy, you're doing something harmful to the child. The kid is destabilized. They have a blow up. The therapist then blames the other parent. By the way, that's very common. So now the therapy has failed, and it can't be me. I've been practicing as a therapist for 30 years. It's got to be her. She didn't take ownership. So not you know, it's adding insult to injury. Not only is the therapist getting it backwards, but now they're blaming the victim for the therapy when, in fact, you were offering futile therapy. And last, and I'll end with this slide, um, in severe cases, it's almost never appropriate to say, oh, the kid's going to age out in a few months or a year. Um, I was discussing this with someone yesterday where there's a couple years left. And um, some of the people who treat these kids are able to turn it around in four days. Dr. Ray has a program in Canada. Uh, Dr. Warshak has a program in Texas. There's a program here in California. And they turn this around so fast that when I tell people that, they think I'm making it up. So awesome. thank you all very much. I'm just right there. Well, I guess we could use a couple more days of this kind of information, right? It's never enough. And um, I just want to say we are so privileged to have such a panel and a group of such professionals who are supporting all of the families here to participate with us this weekend. And uh, the symposium was actually uh, initiated after many of the parents came to us and said, how can you have all these people in town and not let us see them or hear from them? So thank you to Steve and all the other experts who are so willing to participate and donate your time to do this. Um, without uh, mention, I would like to mention the other professionals. And if you would please stand, I would like to acknowledge you so that the other parents can know who you are. We know we read your books. and. Um, you are very supportive of our lives, so I would like you to each stand. Uh, first, we have Dr. Amy Baker. <laughs> Dr. William Burnett. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, Dr. Michael Bone. We heard from him earlier. <laughs> Linda K. Scottley. She left also. Okay, we heard from her. Dr. Steve Miller. Brian Ledner. Dr. Douglas Darnell. Dr. Catherine Andre. She here? I think she comes in later. Dr. Kathleen Ray. Robert Samery, he was here a few minutes oh. ago, and Dr. Rebecca Bailey, I think she comes in tonight as well, and Catherine McWillie. So I say to everyone, these are the experts who have come into town to work together to discuss what is there to do. They clearly, from the uh, conversations today understand exactly what we're going through. They're trying to help us. And this meeting of the colloquium this weekend will be about discussing what is there to do to move forward and stop this abuse with velocity. So we welcome you all to town um, and hope that this is going to be a highly productive meeting. We know that it will be, actually. Um, I would like to thank the parents for supporting this organization to be able to bring this about and helping to support ISNAF in our fundraising and our organizing and our vo all the volunteers. And I would also like to lastly really recognize this committee who has brought this to you. While I'm the face on that committee, I am not the one who put all this work into it. 
So I would like to acknowledge each of the committee participants. If you would please come up, I would like to acknowledge you. It's been a year of a lot of work, a lot of planning. Um, first, I'm going to start with uh, Doug Wolf. He's our committee chair for this event. <laughs> Next, I will go to our co-president, George Ross. Second co-president is will be stepping down shortly. However, she is here. She's actually coordinating food and registration. We have Ling Wang. We have Pat Hurst. She's in charge of our marketing. We have Mike Kinsaki. He's in charge of our advocacy. We have Ernie Salem. He's in charge of our education program. And for those of you who aren't aware, we uh, ISNAP has put together an educational program. We will be stepping into the Long Beach School District of 73,000 children and educating the counselors and the psychologists about alienation and how to help these children. And we thank the experts, the panel that were, was here up here earlier for taking a look at that and helping guide us to get that together. And we're actually using their work in putting together the program. And um, I would also like to introduce Jim. He's one of our committee members as well. Jim Geiser. Before we leave, I just wanted to invite you all to please go to the back. We have books by many of these experts. They will be there to sign them, including Amy. Thank you, Amy, for making a diligent effort to be here. Um, please do buy these books. They're actually highly regarded and will help our cases. And I will say to you, please keep up the hope. You heard today how quickly it can change. And it could be devastating to be in it, but also please continue coming out, coming to support groups, getting yourself knowledgeable, talking to the experts. Um, get out of our bedrooms is basically it, because hiding out is doing nothing. And stop being fearful that we'll be judged and ridiculed for what we've undergone because you see we are truly also secondary victims and I will always say the child is the primary victim always. So thank you for all your support and come, up, come back to another meeting of ISNAP.